and also to welcome uh, George, Emma and Trevor who are joining us uh, by phone. Um, they are now uh, started the meeting and we are broadcasting live on the website and in the building. Just to, as ever to ask any members that have any uh, phones or devices to try and keep them clear of the microphones. Um, if we start on item one then, no apologies because we have a full committee membership attending. Um, item two is draft minutes. Uh, they're available for members on page five of the meeting pack. Are members content that they are a true reflection of the proceedings? Yep. Okay, so that's a of those. Um, matters arising, uh, I have no matters arising from uh, the meeting of last week. Any members, any matters arising? Okay. So then we can move on then to uh, item four, which is the COVID update from the First and Deputy First Minister. And we'll get them and unshortened. Maintaining our good social distancing, so. <laughs> Your social bubble. <laughs> yes, our bubble. It does feel it's somewhat like a classroom as well, on those little desks at the back. So uh, you're not too bad. Craig's been naughty. Well, you don't give us or he was sent to the, the very back of the class. It is like quite. a classroom. <laughs> Um, okay, um, Ministers, thank you very much indeed for coming along today. Um, the purpose of um, your visit with us today is to give us an update on the Department and the uh, Executive's response to the COVID um, pandemic. Obviously, some of the members here are also members of the Health Committee and other committees that are having various uh, elements of their work is directed towards the, the COVID, but the overall responsibility obviously lies with yourselves um, as the Joint First Ministers and the, the Executives. So if we can pass it over to yourselves just to give us an update on how you've been getting on, where you are, and then we'll take questions after. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and very much welcome the opportunity to give the Committee a general oversight uh, of the current state of play in relation to COVID-19 uh, and the response of the Executive to it. Uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, the management of COVID-19 um, has been the executive's number one priority, as I'm sure you'll all appreciate. Our objective has been to save lives, uh, protect the public by reducing the spread uh, of the virus and avoiding uh, the NHS becoming overwhelmed. Uh, I do want to acknowledge the contribution that the Assembly has made to our response. I think the decision to t temporarily halt Assembly questions and the establishment of the ad hoc committee has allowed us as an executive to maintain our focus on directing uh, our response uh, while still ensuring that MLAs have, of course, uh, the appropriate oversight of what we are doing. I think ministers have lived up to the commitment that there will be regular updates to MLAs with 19 statements uh, made to either the Assembly plenary session or to the ad hoc committee on COVID-19 uh, with further statements planned uh, this week and next. Uh, I believe the current arrangements have worked well for everyone uh, and show the sort of joined up approach uh, and frankly mature approach that we need to have when dealing uh, with a crisis of this magnitude. Executive has been meeting regularly throughout the crisis. Uh, initially we met daily as an executive COVID crisis management committee uh, in recognition of the fluid and fast moving nature of the situation we were all facing. Uh, we then moved to a pattern of meeting three times a week as an executive uh, and more recently to twice per week with the majority of business still being uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, the scale of the challenge posed by COVID-19 is so great that we have enacted our civil contingency arrangements. Uh, that's in line with the approach taken in other devolved administrations uh, and in Whitehall. The operational response to the pandemic has been coordinated by uh, the Northern Ireland Hub and then the hub structure ensures a, a coordinated and joined up situational awareness of issues across departments and helps then to promote a whole of government response uh, to the key issues. We put in place measures such as the lockdown and social distancing to try to control the spread of the virus, uh, protect the NHS and save lives, as I've said. And taking the decisions to implement the measures was not easy, uh, but I have no doubt, we all have no doubt, that this action saved lives. 
We have been working closely with the UK Government and indeed the Irish Government on the response. Deputy First Minister, Health Minister and I regularly attend COBRA meetings with the UK Government uh, and the appropriate Executive <coughs> Ministers attend the UK Government Ministerial Implementation Groups. That close engagement has led to good outcomes for us. For example, through engagement in the Ministerial uh, Implementation Group, we were able to secure specific support to our airports uh, and ferries and maintain supply chains between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Of course, we can't be complacent. We have managed to slow the transmission of the virus and bring the R value down, uh, but there's still a job of work to do. Uh, in particular, we are, and I know this committee is taking uh, a close look at how we protect those within our care homes, uh, who are often uh, the most vulnerable in our society, and the Health Minister is looking specifically at what actions he can take on this issue, and you'll be aware that he's recently announced that testing will be rolled out to all care home staff uh, and residents, and of course we very much welcome that. We have recognised that everyone has a part to play in tackling the virus, and we've asked people to take difficult steps such as uh, social isolation and to stay at home where possible. To enable them to do this, we've put in various support measures, and some of the measures have been implemented on a UK-wide basis, such as the job retention scheme, while others have been developed and implemented by ourselves to address the specific needs uh, of Northern Ireland, uh, including schemes such as the rates relief, and of course there was an update in relation to that just yesterday. We are constantly reviewing the supports available. Uh, we have agreed to extend the rate relief scheme as well as provide support to local councils uh, and to charities. We've put in specific measures when people are facing particular hardships, for example, the Department for Communities has been working with councils on the provision of food packages to some of the most vulnerable uh, in our society. Last week we published the document explaining our approach to our decision making and we have emphasised that the pathway will not be influenced by dates and I know perhaps that's something members will want to discuss today but rather that it is informed by science with progression towards more relaxations only happening when we have the evidence that it is safe uh, to do so. That may mean delay uh, in reducing relaxations and members will already be aware that we've eased restrictions in a number of areas, uh, particularly in relation to outdoor gatherings uh, of up to six people, allowing places of worship to open for individual prayer and to allow some other outdoor activities which do not involve shared surfaces and where social distancing can be maintained. We have been, of course, taking account of the advice of our Chief Medical Officer, Chief Scientific Advisor, because uh, we feel the easements we have made so far are proportionate. Uh, and of course, we would like to go further. Uh, we're very conscious of the impact that lockdown is having, uh, including particularly in the week that's in it on mental health. Uh, however, we also have to recognise that COVID-19 is still with us, and therefore we have to take a balanced uh, approach. We'll continue to engage with the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor, and indeed the Deputy First Minister and I have a, a further meeting with them both uh, this afternoon. So while our top priority will remain our focus uh, on, on COVID-19 uh, until uh, such times as this has sufficiently diminished, um, our next priority, of course, is to mitigate the impacts uh, on our economy and all we can do to aid recovery. And as I indicated last week, the Minister for the Economy will be bringing forward a roadmap for recovery for the economy, and that will come to the Executive very shortly. Also recognise that our education sector has been particularly affected with the closures of schools and alternative arrangements that have to be put in place around exams. And uh, the Minister for Education will bring a paper to the Executive on next steps for that sector also in the near future. To support a safe return to work when the time is right, the Economy Minister has asked the Engagement Forum, which was set up, uh, as you know, a couple of weeks ago and chaired by the Labour Relations Agency, to consider the guidance recently published by the UK Government to assess whether we could improve on the workplace guidance, which we have already in place. That should not be viewed as a trade-off between people help, people's health uh, and economic development, because I take the view that the two are inextricably linked uh, and one cannot happen without the other. So, Mr Chairman, going forward, we will remain focused on health and wellbeing of our people, our society and our economic uh, renewal and, and recovery. 
driven by science, and uh, we will emerge from the current arrangements uh, in the safest way that we possibly can. I'll hand over to the Deputy First Minister. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for <coughs> inviting us to speak to you today. And can I just put on record my thanks to the committee for all the work that's been done over what is probably the most challenging of times that any of us have ever been through, um, certainly for, for the executive itself. Um, it, it's it's the, the largest uh, task that we have we have ever faced, and um, we have to work our way through it to deliver as comprehensive a response as we can to try and protect people. How we handle COVID-19 is quite literally a, a matter of um, life and death. While COVID-19 is primarily a public health issue, there are implications right across the executive, and therefore we've approached the challenges that have been um, caused by COVID-19 in a very methodical way, taking a whole-of-government approach and being led all the while by the science and the medical advice. We're also very conscious of the need to maintain um, public support for what we're doing, and we need to be open and transparent in all of this. So that regular press conference, which we have um, every day, hosted by ministers from right across the executive, has been a key part in the communication of this work. To support the whole government approach, we put in place a strategy that helped to guide us in our response. And that strategy identified three key priorities, the health and well-being of our citizens, our economic well-being, and societal and community well-being. And everything we have done has been aimed at delivering uh, the best outcomes and measured against those priorities. We've been consistently working across departmental boundaries throughout our response. Our departments are focused on delivering support where it's needed and where it will have the most impact. Um, the work by the Minister for Infrastructure to support NHS workers using public transport, the work by the Minister of Health and the Minister of Communities um, in terms of um, supporting those that are shielding are all excellent examples of um, cross-departmental working. We've had to take some very difficult decisions as an executive, and we've had to take decisions around restricting the movements of our, of our citizens and on directing certain premises to close. These, by any means, are not um, easy decisions. They're the sort of tough decisions that no government ever wants to be in a place to have to take, but they have been necessary in order to protect um, public health. And um, unfortunately, I suppose, as we speak today, by and large, those restrictions remain in place. However, as we advise the ad hoc committee, we're keeping those restrictions under review. And as soon as the evidence allows, we'll take steps to relax measures, recognising all the time that if the situation deteriorates, that we may again have to tighten measures. COVID-19 has impacted the whole of society. And as an executive, we've worked to put in place measures to um, provide support to those who are facing hardship. We're supporting our businesses through grant schemes and through rate relief. And we supported our ferry companies and airports to keep critical goods moving. We've discussed the potential for um, further expanding um, the rate relief, and we've agreed, obviously, um, yesterday the support package to, um, in terms of the rate relief scheme and those that are facing hardship. We're also helping the most vulnerable in our society who are facing additional pressures, for example, by making direct payments to those in receipt of free school meals and through the delivery of food packages to all those people that are shielding. These measures have built on other supports which are available, such as the coronavirus job retention scheme and supports available to the self-employed. We recognise that we cannot work in isolation to address this pandemic and coordinated action is required across these islands and we're engaging both with London and Dublin to ensure that our response is as joined up as is possible. A key example of our commitment to ensure a coordinated response was the signing of the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, by both health ministers on the island to facilitate greater cooperation in public health matters, which have an all-island um, element, as is clearly the case with COVID-19. We're also working hard to ensure that our care homes are properly supported and that residents are protected. We know that older people are particularly susceptible to this virus, so we must ensure that measures are in place to protect them. Testing of residents and staff has been significantly expanded through the ambulance service, and that's already started uh, to provide a mobile testing service for care homes. Homes have also been asked to check staff residents twice a day for symptoms, including temperature. We are committed as an executive to ensuring residents in our care homes are as safe as they can be. And testing is also key to tackling this crisis. As well as the work being done in care homes and to support frontline workers, the Minister for Health has rolled out targeted testing in some areas where there has been clusters of outbreaks, for example, in, sub, um, in some of the food processing plants. The Health and Safety Executive have also been offering guidance um, to employers to ensure appropriate steps have been taken to protect worker safety. This is building on the work that's been done by the Stakeholders Forum. 
So while COVID-19 has been our priority, we have not forgotten that people also still suffer from other illnesses and also need treatment. We know that some non-urgent treatments have been postponed, however, as far as possible, treatments have continued. We are very conscious of the need to ensure that people can access health care when they need it, and the Minister of Health is working hard to ensure that this is the case. We recognise that we also need to look forward in the middle of the crisis, and we've been, we have published how we're, appropriately, or how we're approaching coronavirus decision-making, and we've set out our five-stage plan for slowly easing restrictions. We've been very clear that we'll not be guided by the calendar, but we'll be um, guided down this pathway by um, consider three uh, key criteria. The most up-to-date science that we have, the ability of the health service to be able to, to cope, and the wider impact that it has then on health and society and the economy. We have already moved in some elements, and we will move um, on others as soon as it's safe to do so. One of the elements which plays an important part, an important role in limiting the impact of the second wave and help in breaking the transmission of the virus is to test, trace and isolate, and the support strategy which the executive is currently considering. However, the test, trace and isolate support strategy will need to sit alongside current advice regarding good hand hygiene and social distancing, because as we all know, COVID-19 is going to be with us for some time um, to come. And as an executive, we will continue to work together to deliver the best response to COVID-19 that we can. So I'll just finish there, Chair, and open it up for, for questions and views. Okay, um, thank you very much indeed. And Ministers, can I maybe begin by thanking you for um, both yourselves and all of the Executive Ministers for the work that you have undertaken in the last number of months. Um, I have um, for every surety that it has meant very long hours for you. I know that that will have been at the sacrifice of family time and your own uh, personal time. And I'm sure that, like many people at the beginning of this process, everybody was quite scared and fearful um, and people had to step up and do their work. And I think we, we should put on record our thanks to the executive for um, the work that has been done there. Um, I think that in some elements, the, the, certainly the speed of the response has been quite impressive. And I think that there are things that we wouldn't have expected to have been achieved in ordinary times have been achieved. And that has certainly uh, been reasonably good. It's been good to see that. And also to see the five uh, party response as well as something that we had all uh, tried to aspire to in the uh, agreement back in January to move them towards that. Um, uh, there's always a however or a but, a but and all that. There. I hope that the questions that I'm sure the committee, myself and others will ask, is taken in the spirit of holding for accountability and for transparency. Uh, and certainly I know uh, from my own questions there, there is no doubting everything that has been said at this stage. So maybe to move um, on to the questions. I want to take you back maybe to the very beginning, because at the beginning it was a bit unstable. Um, relationships didn't appear to be good, and I fear that that may have caused a little delay in some of the responses, and that potentially that delay may have led to some people catching the virus that, did, that didn't need to. Um, do you feel that, that there were lessons learned from that, and that that you feel that certainly within the executive office, which is often two separate wings, uh, that it is fully functioning together now? Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your good wishes. Certainly, um, when uh, the Deputy First Minister and I came back into government with all of the other ministers on the 11th of January, we knew there would be challenges ahead, um, things to uh, that we would have to work our way through. Little did we think that we would have to deal with uh, a global pandemic, frankly. And I think despite... Um, what may have been perceived as, a difference, as differences at time, we have worked through those differences. Uh, I'm not sure what decisions you're referring to when you talk about maybe they would have been taken in a faster fashion, uh, but maybe if you have examples, you, could, you, can, you can give those to us. But uh, certainly I feel that uh, we have worked our way through those things because we had, despite our different backgrounds and political philosophies, a, a desire to protect the people of Northern Ireland uh, and a desire to make sure that our National Health Service was protected and would be able to cope with whatever was coming towards it. Um, I, I know there will be a lot of looking back uh, over the next uh, number of months and years as to how we dealt uh, with all of that, but all I can say to you is that uh, as we were faced with the challenge, we were determined to do what was right by the people who had elected us, who had put us here, and who wanted us to act on their behalf. 
Yeah, I think that, um, well, first, again, thanks for your, your complimentary um, words. I think that there will be plenty of time for reflection uh, after all of this. I think the priority now is that we're still in a fight. We're still in a battle against COVID-19, and that's where we all need to remain focused. Um, Arlene's right. I mean, we, we had three years of, of trying to get the Assembly established, and I, for one, am very thankful that we're in our positions, political leadership, the Charter way through this, this period right now. Um, we're a five-party uh, five parties working together in the executive. That's always going to be challenging in the, in the most normal of times. Um, but this is not normal times. This is abnormal, very much so, and very alien to, to all of us. Um, and it's only natural that at different times you're going to have a different emphasis on approach, and, and, and that's, that's, just, that's just life. Um, but I believe that we have been able to uh, agree and even disagree well um, and work our way through these things. And, and I think that the what the executive, I hope, what the executive has been able to demonstrate to the public that elected us to come here and to look after them and to take the right decisions and show leadership. I, th I hope that they can see that this executive um, has value in our society and that actually it's been able to lead and actually take our own decisions that suit our population. And um, I hope that people can see that. But certainly um, there'll be a time for in the aftermath for reflection and, and I would absolutely support that because you have to have learning in everything that you do. Um, but for now, I think that we need to continue to work together and work our way through this because obviously um, COVID is still spreading and we want to mitigate against potential um, further waves coming um, down the line. And, and certainly the, the feedback from people on the ground is that they prefer it when they see their executive, executive office as two parties, but executive as five parties working together and pulling in the, um, in the one direction. That, that gives faith and courage and hope the people out there so that's something that that's good to hear that that will continue um, in the best interest for people um, and maybe just uh, as part of it because there is the, the five party approach just looking at the communication just of, of the various um, initiatives that have progressed uh, I'll, I'll mention this just because it might knock Christopher off his chair but we, we, we've, we're well versed that there are 44 press officers within uh, the executive um, so when we look at the um, Probably not me off my chair. It was me who raised it. So, but no, there, I mean there are plenty there, and and yet you know um, we get some announcements at eleven o'clock on a TV at, at night time. We you know sometimes whenever the announcements are made, there there is an element of the inbox lighting up afterwards. You know people, you just get a deluge of people saying, "Does this mean we can do that? Does this mean that the other?" Are we allowed to go here? Can we hug our grandchildren? Are we allowed? And, and it just seems sometimes that the information, there could just be a bit more detail on it, maybe number one. Um, and number two, um, I, I would maybe suggest that there might be some single point of entry, uh, be it an email address or a telephone number, uh, that MLAs can ring into or email into with a very, very specific questions. Now, it might mean that after you make an announcement, that the next day that inbox might get 100 emails and then it will be quiet until the next one. But it's just people are coming to us for information and we, we're not the experts as to what the, the rules do or do not permit. And if there isn't the clarity in the statement, it would be good to have somebody named in the executive office that we could go back to to be able to say, does this mean that this particular sport can happen or does it mean that this particular activity can take place? Is that something that would be a possibility? The portal already exists, um, Colin, in terms of being able to put to feed questions into that. Certainly, I've said in the chamber that I encourage members to submit their questions. So if, when you go on to the, the, the portal, if the information isn't there, if you can't find it to be able to assist a constituent or someone who's got in touch with you, um, then we, we've been encouraging people to actually feed their questions into that system so that the hub, which is at the centre of our response to this, it's able to populate the information onto the system. I think probably... There's a mixture of, of um, people are had a great desire for information because this was coming thick and fast. There's not many things being rolled out and schemes being rolled out. And there was a lot of unanswered questions. Um, I certainly got it as like a representative. Everybody did. And we wanted to be able to provide answers. I don't think we, there always was the answers in just like that, the way people wanted them. Um, but of course, there's always um, learning and all these things that, again, I mean, we have uh, an information service. It was about get, um, trying to... We did try to populate it as best we can, but I would certainly not sit here and defend that all the information was always there um, whenever people needed it. 
um, but we'll have to we'll have to just try and improve that as we go on. And just today, actually, we've written to the speaker um, in response to a letter from the speaker around information points, and we've provided him with central contact points for MLA and party queries for each of the departments. So that will probably go out to everybody from now on. So um, that's there, and we've sent it in, and it's, it, it contains an email address and a, and a telephone number. So if there's very specific issues around a department, you can now send them in to, to a central point in the department. Because we have been trying to move as fast as we can, and sometimes that means that we are laying regulations. As uh, The first regulations, I think, were laid on a Saturday evening. Um, so we were trying to get that in place to protect people, uh, and a, as a result of that, people were why you laying regulations at five o'clock. I remember the press conference Michelle and I did um, the day before, and they were, they, the, the press were saying, well, where are the regulations? Why have you not laid them? And then we laid them as fast as we could, and, and that was in the evening of the Saturday, which for some people doesn't suit either, but you know, we're learning as we go along, Chair, I think it's fair to say, around all of these things. Uh, Michelle has been quoted as saying there's no rule book. There isn't a rule book in any of this, and where you said at the beginning there have been some things that have happened in a way that you never thought the civil service would be able to deliver. I mean, for us, that's exactly the case as well. Um, things that normally take a month or far longer are happening overnight. So uh, we lo look back at all of this and see what we can learn out of it and what positives we can take out of it, as well as obviously looking back to see what mistakes were made. One of the things that we've actually taken into account, we said that as we move through the easements and been able to lift some of the restrictions, one, once we decide that we can do it, we want to get it out as quickly as possible. But two, um, there has to be a bit of a plan around the communication of that. So we heard this week that some people perhaps weren't ready to be able to open up things whenever we made the announcement in terms of outdoor. So we're listening to all of that and we'll mm. try to communicate that better to allow people to have the information. The, the Saturday night one is definitely a good example of where the phone lit up afterwards, and I think it kept going to about two o'clock in the morning before and all those ones. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's when it has to be done and has yeah. to be responded to. Um, we, we just had the health committee um, this morning that I'm also a member of, um, and we're looking at the health minister has made the suggestions about the um, tracing uh, and about the use of, of the app. There's two elements that, that just maybe worry me a little bit. Number one is is it definitely being considered and pursued that on a north-south basis those apps can communicate to each other um, and and you know that maybe we I know without wishing to open up a whole UK Ireland but you know we're on an island here which is different from another island where they have an app that is relevant to there and if we simply are feeding into that system but missing the the one where we have cross-border workers we've got people that will be traveling back and forward across the border you know if it's a tracing app it's, it's imperative that those actually communicate with each other so that we know. Have you been getting assurances for that? And also, you have both made the point that it's going to be here for quite a number of years. Um, you know, in terms of Brexit, um, is there likely to be some sort of special arrangement that will be needed to share that information? Because obviously information is going to data that's going to be held uh, within the south and data that's within the north. Are we going to be allowed to communicate that back and forward? Because by December 31st, we could be in a different place. I think that the well, one of the issues we actually we had a North South meeting of ministers um, was that yesterday, um, and we all are losing track of the days. But I think it was yesterday. This is one of the issues which we discussed because the app. Remember, the app itself is only going to um, bring some added value to the act to a proper traditional um, tracing system. So it's, it just brings that bit of added value. It's not the one solution to how yeah. we're going to contract um, trace. Um, but that being said, it has benefit. Um, so it's really important in terms of the development of it. And I know that the health department are looking at a number of options um, for, for, for this. But in terms of the development of it, it'll only have value if it actually operates and you can share data across the island. Um, so it needs to have north, south and east, west. Um, I have a personal view about it. Um, one... I don't support um, the centralisation of data, so I think that's a, that's a problem from a human rights point of view. And I have a personal view just that um, whatever is developed in the, in the here and now, um, the, 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 in the main, the movements are going to be north-south, not east-west. So this is not a, a political issue, this is about the usefulness and effectiveness of the app. But we're going to continue to have that conversation at the executive, and I don't believe there's any um, settled... Um, position on it yet but there's obviously a number of options that can be explored including building our own app that has connectivity that can um, talk to each other 
um, on this island as well as the East West, please. So I, I think Michelle is absolutely right to say that the app is only part of the contact tracing, and I think for some people they think um, the app's the be all and end all. It's not, and we've heard from the health minister around the fact that there are a number of people trained now to get boots on the ground, I think was the way in which Simon Harris, the Minister in the Republic, described it, um, to deal with contact tracing, and that has already started now, and so we're pleased about that, because I think we're the first in the UK to be involved uh, in that sort of a scheme. Um, in terms of the NHS X app, um, I understand that it's uh, more or less ready to go and so will be available for people to download, if not next week, then the following week. Um, I think the important thing to understand is, and I think Robin has already indicated this, uh, this contact tracing is going to happen for a year. Um, so that being the case, uh, we need to be able to have the east, west and the north, south, So, uh, because obviously people will be travelling in the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, so uh, we are having a lot of conversations about how we can get the technology so that they can speak to each other um, and, and to make sure that all of that happens in a timely fashion, um, because it is something that will be with us for quite some time and it's important that we have all of the information so that we can trace <clears throat> people in the community uh, particularly where there's clusters thank you look my final question then i suppose is follows on from, from some of that and it really i'll preface it by saying politics aside and perspective on the eu or not aside the coronavirus is going to have a horrendous impact on our economy mm. and it's really going to shatter our tourism and, and a lot of our business sectors. If an extension to um, and a delay to Brexit was going to enable a better economic outcome uh, for our businesses, is it surely not a good thing to ask for? Well, I think that's quite a pejorative question, uh, Chair, because you're saying if, and of course we don't know the costs associated with an extension to transition uh, and all of those matters. Um, you will know that the protocol, the command paper, has been issued today in relation to the UK government's approach to uh, the implementation of the protocol. Um, we haven't... Uh, been able to look at all of the detail of that thus far, but it certainly looks as if there is a desire to minimise the amount of disruption uh, in relation to Northern Ireland. There are four foundational principles as to how they're going to move forward. We welcome that. Uh, we very much want to see as little disruption in terms of trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. There's a commitment to unfettered access for Northern Ireland to Great Britain. We welcome that as well. Uh, and I think it is important uh, that we look at that approach to the protocol and now we move forward uh, to make sure that we get a good outcome uh, for businesses here in Northern Ireland. So there's no, just in terms of the extension, there's no agreed executive position on that. Um, perhaps we'll get there, but we're certainly not there at this moment in time. Um, but Sinn Féin obviously have said on, publicly on the record that we would um, support an extension. But I think just from the point of view that, you know, businesses are already dealing with the shock of COVID-19 and then Brexit on top of it. Um, and clearly a lot of progress hasn't been made uh, in terms of the negotiations. Uh, so I think that an extension is a wise. Uh, uh, that's my personal um, view, obviously, but there isn't a collective executive position yet. But you will obviously get information that we wouldn't be necessarily privy to as a committee, so you would be in a better position to take that call as to whether an extension would be of a benefit or not. So is that something that you can discuss? And Well, as you know, we had a, a Brexit subcommittee set up. That Brexit subcommittee has now merged into the executive, so we have a standing item on the executive to discuss Brexit uh, once a week. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll be discussing it again at uh, the Monday uh, meeting, as I understand it, so I'm sure we'll be discussing the information that's in front of us then. I think we're probably, as a committee, keen to get you back maybe the next time to look at the Brexit, given that time, sure. if that's about three or four weeks down the line, that, that might be, we might be all in a better position to, to explore that. But thank you for answering my questions. I'm going to pass you on to uh, the Deputy Chair, um, Doug. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, Mr. thank you for taking the time to, to come and speak to us. I mean, it really is enlightening. And um, if I could just echo what the Chair said, uh, cohesion in a crisis is really what you need to beat a crisis. Uh, and, and I'll be honest, and it's not popular to say this, um, I have seen cohesion, uh, and that is positive, and that people want to see that cohesion. So that's partly um, through your leadership, uh, and it's also clearly partly through the leadership of all of the other ministers. Uh, uh, and, and of course, there'll be differences of opinions. We, we know that. Um, you know, we'll have different opinions, no doubt, here today. But um, I, I just want to put on record: I, I, I think you know this cohesion is is really, really important. Um, 
But I just wanted to, 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 to try and expand something, if I can, please, because um, this is an all government approach to dealing with COVID-19, and we, we, I get that, uh, and, and it needs to be. But in doing that, we have primary and secondary effects, and the primary effects are, are, are quite clear to see, where we, we are stopping people from being able to go out and, and socialise, and there's issues in regards to healthcare and various other things. But what about the secondary effects? Uh, the other things that, in regards to how government works, are, are sort of being knocked out or knocked off kilter. So I wonder if there's any tip way you could give me a sort of a, a general view on how government is working at this moment in time, um, uh, all of the other things that, that might have been pushed off uh, because of, of COVID-19, not using COVID-19 as an excuse, but just the realities of how government is working and the executive office is working. I would go as far as to say we're probably, because we've had to have so many meetings that we're actually working in a very joined up way right now. Um, we're, we were initially meeting three times a week and then we're also tr very conscious that we didn't lose, the, that the Assembly didn't lose its role. So I think how we were able to adjust to create the ad hoc committee to allow statements, to allow you know different ministers to come in, I think that's all important because we all deserve to be um, scrutinised as well as um, supported through this, 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 this um, place. So I think that uh, clearly because the Assembly was only established again for a number of weeks before COVID hit, everything focused on to COVID. And then, um, but, but we now need to, as we are progressing through, through the response to COVID, we now have to get back to doing other things that we had promised, um, for example, in the new decade, new approach. So we, w we certainly want to get back there again. I think we're, we're moving gradually into that space again. Um, government has to keep functioning. We still have to keep doing the day to day as much as you can. Um, but clearly, for a while there, everything was parked because everything was COVID related. But I think we're now quickly moving back into the space where we want to get back into the assembly. Let's talk about building for the future. Let's talk about delivery on the commitments that we made. Um, that we all, um, from our own uh, perspectives, um, fought for throughout the three years that the Assembly was down. So let's get back to, to getting those things back on the agenda as where I think um, we should get to very quickly. So I think we have shown that uh, when there's a necessity, we can be flexible. And I think that's true of politicians as well as the civil service. Um, things that we were told couldn't be done, particularly if the finance minister was here, he'd talk to you about procurement. And the fact that uh, a lot of the procurement rules have had to be, um, I'll not say dismissed, but certainly uh, that we've had to be very flexible around some of those issues. And that, that's something to look at in the future because we want to be able to support um, our own businesses moving forward and we want to be able to make sure that we work uh, with them. So flexibility uh, around how we have been able to respond. but. Uh, as Michelle has said, I mean, there are things that we committed to doing in the new decade, new approach, which have gone past their time frame. Um, therefore, we will have to revisit some of those things uh, to make sure that we pick them up whenever we're out of uh, crisis management and moving into recovery and renewal. Not, of course, uh, minimising the impact that this has had on our society, uh, on the general health of the population, the known COVID health issues, and, of course, uh, in relation to the economic uh, piece that's here, because when you see the unemployment figures yesterday, and people were quite shocked by them, but look, if we didn't have the furloughing scheme, they would be much, much worse. And that's my real concern, that when that furloughing scheme comes to an end and is tapered away, what happens to some of those jobs, and how can we support those people and mm. put in the mechanisms that we need? So. There's, you know, we're in we're in the rec we're in the response phase. When we move to recovery and renewal, there will be huge challenges first, Doug. Thanks, Minister. I, I mean, I, you, you're, you're right. You're absolutely clear. But can I maybe be a little bit more pointed then in in, in, in something that I'm trying to get to the, the bottom of? Because I think you alluded to it, first, Minister, when you said some things in the, the, the new deck or new approach we've, we've bypassed and we'll have to revisit them again. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, VSS in here talking yeah. to us about the work, the fantastic work uh, that they're doing. Um, and in 10 days' time, the victim's pension scheme is supposed to kick in. Yeah. Um, can I ask, have we nominated an administrator to administrate this yet? Have we found out who is going to fund this scheme? Um, and is there still a united approach within the executive or has the victim's payment scheme become a casualty of COVID-19? Well, I don't think it's become a casualty. It certainly hasn't happened in as fast a way as we would have liked it to have happened in, in keeping with commitments that were made. 
uh, and some of those commitments, of course, were made in Westminster and, and not in this place, and we then uh, were fulfilling them. Uh, to answer your question about funding, we still haven't clarity on funding. Uh, it is our view that because it's a, a Westminster initiative that it should come uh, from Her Majesty's Treasury. Uh, we certainly don't have the wherewithal within the block grant uh, to deal with the issue, and it's something that we have been taking up uh, through the Finance Minister with the Treasury. Uh, we need to continue to do that. Uh, officials are working in the background, but I, it's difficult to form um, a way forward until we know particularly where the funding is coming from, Doug. And it's not it's something that I am very committed to. It's something I want to see happening. We have raised a legitimate expectation with a whole range of individuals right across Northern Ireland, and we need to fulfil that expectation for them. And that's my view. Yeah, and I think that I mean, we stand over all the commitments that were made in the in previous agreements and including the new decade, new approach, and that includes the victims' payment um, scheme. And we know that people are very anxious waiting for this, and we have to be very sensitive to those people that you know that have been injured and that are eagerly awaiting this for for quite some time. There, these issues need to be clarified around the issue of funding, um, the issue of guidance. You know, and certainly um, we want to get to the point where we're able to progress the provision of a pension because that's was part of the, the Stormont House um, agreement. And you know, I have met with you know Wave. I've met with uh, many of those people that have been injured, and we need to make sure that um, this payment is is made to all victims, and it is made in a way that allows um, people to have a better quality of life because that's what it's about. Okay, thank thank you. And and not wanting to labour this, and, and 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 probably a pointed answer would be really useful because you, you mentioned something, uh, Michelle, about societal well-being. Uh, and those people who are expecting this to kick mm. in in 10 days, if it's not going to happen in 10 days, yeah. it, is, it, is it time to tell them, we're sorry, we haven't made this deadline, it's not going to happen in 10 days? Because for the very reasons you've just told me, um, that people need to know that, that we're still committed to it, there's issues to fix, it's not going to happen in 10 days. Is, is that a fair assessment? Well, I think it's a fair assessment to say that there needs to be communication around this issue, and uh, the Victims Commissioner has, I think, written to us, Michelle, in, in this past few days uh, about the issue. Uh, we'll obviously be speaking to her about the issue, and there are some victims groups who are making representations as well, as you would expect. Um, I'm disappointed we haven't been able to make, make pro, uh, progress, let's be honest, but I'm also realistic to know that we're in, we're in the midst of this pandemic. Is very difficult. <laughs> I'm going to say George. Maybe true. if you know, just some random person. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you, good mum. <laughs> okay, so I, I mean, I am disappointed, but I'm hoping that we now get a renewed focus on the issue again. Um, I, I know that we may come to discuss the historical institutional abuse uh, issue later on, and in, in with some of your members, chair, um, that's a better story. Um, but we want to make this into a good story as well for people. And just maybe to, to add to it, because the victims' payment is one part of a package of legacy. Um, it measures that need to be implemented and if we are going to have to be successful in trying to heal the wounds of the past to move to make sure we don't burden a new generation with with the past then we need to deal with legacy in, in, in the round and all these things need to be delivered upon and implemented upon and we need to show leadership on them because um, this is a crucial part in my mind of reconciling people and actually um, allowing people to move forward. Yeah, and, and, and you're right, of course. Um, and I suppose the whole thing in the round, and, and I have, I've not really got any more questions, but I suppose the whole thing in the round is, is, to, is to people understanding which elements of, of sure. government are, are, are just not being able to hit the mark at the moment. I mean, you know, a programme for government, you know, when we see a full function programme for government, that's going to be a bit down the road. And I guess people are looking to try and have a somewhere to, to look forward to, to see where we're, we're going on this, um, so that we have those societal well-being, so that we start to look at, as we are with healthcare, not just looking at COVID-19, but dealing with the cancer sufferers as well. But yeah. it's exactly the same in a political sphere, that we need to come out of the COVID-19 bubble, which we have to be in, because we need to start looking at those other issues which people are expecting to be, be brought forward. And the historical institutional abuse is absolutely one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if there's a good story to come out of that, it'd be great to get that good story soon. Um, but certainly, I, I would have concern. But, but thank you very much for your answers. OK. okay. Um, Pat, we'll move to yourself. OK, thanks, Chair. And thanks, both of you, for coming in. Um, just 
we'll stay for a minute with the COVID-19 stuff. And um, 500, nearly 500 people are now dead, 2,000 maybe across the island. And I was just saying at the health committee this morning that uh, there's many unique things about this pandemic and the, and the disease. Uh, but one of the unique things is that absolutely nearly everybody has been affected in some way. Uh, my next door neighbour was one of the first diagnosed. Uh, Alex Easton was saying in the committee this morning that his sister, who's a nurse, has been diagnosed with it. Uh, others have elderly relatives that are shielded and they can't see them, kids off school, so on and so forth. And at the committee this morning, the time the committee was on, I actually should have been at a, a funeral of a long-time friend of mine uh, who died a couple of days ago from COVID-19. I played Gillick football with him in the same club. He also played Irish League soccer for Distillery. He was uh, an all-round superb athlete, a uh, great family man and, and a loyal friend. And uh, unfortunately, given the circumstances we're in, the problems with funerals, that people can't go to funerals, and, I mean, he comes from a, a relatively big family, and yet only 10 can go along to the graveside. We can't have the wakes uh, in the same way that, that we normally would. And I'm just wondering, uh, has there been any thought given to uh, a permanent memorial to all these people have died? Because given the scale of the numbers of people who are dying, often you're not hearing, and because we're not socialising in the same way that we were, you're maybe not hearing of somebody who you knew has died, and they don't get the same level of support that they would under normal circumstances. And I would ask the executive to give some thought to a permanent memorial to the people who have died so that they just don't end up as statistics somewhere, uh, that there's, there's recognition given to their faces as such. And I wonder, uh, would, would the executive uh, consider a, a project like that? I think that's a very... Um a very good suggestion and something that we certainly should take away and look at because I think that you're right. I mean, you're highlighting the real human mm. tragedy of, of all of this and how we traditionally bury our dead and our normal natural instinct to want to be surrounded by your family and your friends and people come to pay their respects and all those things. Nobody's been, everybody's been denied that right now and I think there's going to be a, there's an aftermath and all of that for people and just in terms of their own emotional well-being and and how you actually deal with your own grief. So I think that um, the, this is something that, that we have to recognise, and that's why we're conscious about people's mental health and well-being, and emotional well-being. That's why whenever you're balancing all these decisions around what can or cannot happen, you have to take into account, be guided by the science, but you have to weigh up the, the benefit of doing something in terms of trying to control the virus spread, and then the negative impact that it has on people and individuals and society. So. Um, that's always a fine, a fine balance, but I think the idea of being able to mark this period in in our existence is actually a, a, a good a good thing and something that we could work on um, together because this is stuff that that people with generations will talk about years to come. People, children will remember that they weren't at school and, and they'll remember the experience when they when they're back in school. Um, we'll all remember it for for varying reasons, and I think that um, I think that a, a, a a lovely memorial type thing would be actually a really, really positive thing for us to do um, when we get to the other side of this. And, and I think that's right, and I think it's a discussion that we should all have as a, a society in Northern Ireland as to how we mark this period of time. I mean, Pat, I'm sorry for your loss at a personal level. I think that um, many people have suffered um, throughout this period of time in the way that you've described. When you mentioned distillery, I thought of my late father, who was a real distillery man. <laughs> Um, and uh, it, it is, it's a very difficult time for people that are grieving because they can't do the traditional things that we do here to grieve. They can't go to someone's house uh, to the wake um, to help people get through their grief. Um, the huge funerals that we're all used to uh, in Northern Ireland, it's a, it's a way of life actually for a lot of uh, particularly uh, rural communities. And I think that will take its toll on people in Northern Ireland and uh, therefore we have to be very alert to that, that people haven't been able to grieve properly. Um, uh, and somebody said to me, you know, normally when you lose somebody, it's always the first that you remember, you know, the first time you met your neighbour, the first time you did went to a shop or whatever, but there's none of that at the moment because you're not doing that. Um, so there is a huge job of work, I think, to be done in relation to mental health. As you know, 
the Health Minister has appointed a mental health champion. Uh, the action plan was launched yesterday. There is a particular section in that around COVID-19, um, but we will have a, a large job of work to do in dealing with um, the aftermath of COVID-19, as well as trying to deal with, as we currently are, the response to COVID-19. Thanks for that. And uh, I just really do think it would be an important uh, issue because, as, as you said yourself, Michelle, I mean, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, people are going to be uh, thinking back or talking about the time of the COVID or coronavirus or whatever it's going to be known as in the future, you know. So, But in any event, I want, I want to move on sort of to normal business away from COVID-19 for a minute or two. And the committee has written to the executive office uh, on a number of, 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 of issues, including clarification on time scales in regard to uh, bills to establish the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression, uh, an Irish language commissioner, a commissioner for focusing on Ulster Scots, Ulster British language, art and literature, as agreed in NDNA. I'm just wondering, uh, can you give any indicative time of when uh, these will be agreed by the executive and brought to the assembly for the proper legislative process? And of course, this, is, uh, this uh, committee will have a role in scrutinising that legislation. Well, certainly, and clearly we were, as I said, we were just in the door and working our way through all these things. So a lot of the priority work is already done um, on the legislation. And um, it was just because of COVID that we had to um, scale back all the other work that wasn't necessary to response to COVID, but the commitment remains and um, we will hope to be in a position to schedule um, some of this legislation with this, in conjunction with the Speaker's Office um, in, the, in the immediate future, obviously, because as we now start to get back to um, regular business, so hopefully within the next um, number of weeks we'll be able to come back, picking up on some of the legislative pieces that we said we would deliver on in NDNA. Um, Trevor Lund. Oh, thank you, Chair, and thank you both for coming today. It's good to see you. Um, I, w I just want to talk about the opening up process generally. Um, when, whenever you announced the, the pathway, the steps, um, my, my impression was that step one would probably start by the end of this month. So uh, I, I should say I agree completely with it. You shouldn't give dates for these things, and you haven't done. That's good. But... Um, it, it actually was all the more pleasing then when you decided to bring forward some of the things directly in step one within a day or two of publishing the steps and I'm thinking of the amenity sites, golf courses, garden centres, and particularly the, the six people gathering out from the same household out of doors. <laughs> um, does that mean that uh, somebody, in terms of length of travel, distance, that somebody living in Coleraine perhaps could come and visit their elderly mother in Lisburn because they needed a bit of assistance. Is, is it as simple as that or is there still this feeling that they shouldn't travel distances? I think the whole point of, I mean, obviously if someone has caring responsibility, they were going to be able to travel anyway, Trevor, under the, under the regulation. Yeah, caring responsibility. Uh, but in order to see somebody outside, um, uh, I think what we would like people to do is to be reasonable in their travel, in other words, not to travel huge distances. Um, but the legislation had to be changed to allow people to go outside and travel to go outside. And uh, because that change has now been made, people can uh, travel. But uh, we have been emphasising, and I know the Health Minister has a very clear view on this, that people should be reasonable in all of that and not be you know, going on long distance journeys just to be outside in a, in a park or whatever. Um, it is about trying to form, and we talk about this in our document, a partnership between the population of Northern Ireland and the executive so that when we try to make a move forward that we have that partnership approach and people will work with us on that. And when Michelle and I spoke to the church leaders last Friday, we were really saying to them, we would like to um, be able to move to allowing private prayer in churches, but we want you to work with us in terms of how you're going to make sure that people are going to be safe, how you're going to make sure that the surfaces are going to be cleaned, because it's the shared surfaces where the real challenge is, because people can pick up um, the virus from shared surfaces. And, and to be fair, they all uh, were very good in relation to that, and that partnership approach, I think, has worked very well. Likewise, the Golfing Union of Ireland... Um, 
who I think were surprised that we had moved into step one, despite the fact that golf is actually specifically mentioned in step one. Uh, they were, were taken a little bit by surprise, uh, but they have now opened their golf course, but they did it in a way again that was safe and, and socially distanced and all of that. So I think people have been on the whole quite responsible about this and we want to continue to have that conversation with people and try and have that uh, partnership approach. The only thing I'd add, Trevor, is that we had said that inbuilt to the plan was flexibility and we demonstrated that then obviously we've been able to move whenever the science said it was safe to do so. I suppose the thing about it is and you know cases be made for different things and you can you can really rationally make a case for a lot of things to happen and to change but you have to remember everything has a cumulative effect and if you don't monitor lifting things and then watch it for a while then you could end up in a situation where we start to see the or the, the fire spread raising again and then we don't want to get there and um, so that's why it is sort of gradual and incremental sort of um, things that we're doing but I think we've allowed ourselves enough flexibility to be able to move and we know people desperately want to know when you can get a hug of your grandchild or that's a question that's said to me just like, generally a hug <laughs> <laughs> not regard I'm quite comfortable with social distancing you're not a huggy person. <laughs> you should hug more, Christopher. Um, but I think that uh, I think that. But you know, just it's that connection with your family that people want, and we want to get there as quickly as possible. But our message is still the same: we'll get there quicker if people keep, yes. you know, minimise the movements and and just be reasonable, and we'll get there quicker. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. It wasn't being critical at all. The the population has been responsible, and they've responded to a responsible approach taken by the executive. So I would commend you. So you know, you've even got the support of the independent sector now. <laughs> uh, there's got a couple of quick ones here. There's been two major suggestions made in the last few days from two unlikely sources. Um, the, the Archbishop has suggested that uh, transfer tests shouldn't be taken this year. Um, is, is that a decision for the Minister of Education or is it an executive decision? And on the same basis, our good friend Michael O'Leary has announced that he's going to start flights from Belfast on the 3rd of July in what he called aluminium tubes where it was impossible to achieve social distancing. So good luck with that one. Is that an executive decision to allow that or is it a commercial decision on behalf of Ryanair? I mean, who, who would it's allow or disallow a decision like that? It's, it's a commercial decision and actually the rules in social distancing, and I know there was um, a lot of annoyance when the Aer Lingus um, flight was packed to the gills and, and there was no social distancing. Um, that's for the Civil Aviation Authority to enforce and, and once you're in the uh, off the airport and in the air when it's at the airport I think it's the role of the health and safety executive if I'm right um, but once you're on the airplane it's the Civil Aviation Authority. Um, I didn't know that about our good friend Michael O'Leary but um, that's news uh, to me today but uh, yeah so uh, in terms um, of the other issue around transfer tests, as you know, um, the education minister doesn't have the power to set transfer tests. That's uh, uh, com two companies that set those tests uh, and roll them out. And um, Doug asked me about this in, in the chamber. Uh, we don't have a, a similar view in relation to academic selection, but uh, I do think there is a need to look at uh, children who haven't been receiving uh, help when they've been off school. Some children have been. Uh, receiving online learning every day. They have been uh, getting support at home from their parents who have been at home because they've been furloughed or, or not working. Uh, there are other children who don't have that support, uh, and that's where my concern lies, Trevor, in terms of uh, moving forward. So I, I said yesterday that I think there is a piece of work to look at how we can support some of uh, those children. Um, I know Michelle has a different view to me on academic selection. I believe in academic selection because I'm a product of it. Uh, and I, I believe in it because it doesn't matter what your background is, you can go forward and, and, and uh, go to grammar school, and that's, that's what happened to me. But I know that others take a, a different view uh, in relation to that issue. Yeah, well, I'm a product of it as well, and I don't believe in it. But, yeah. I mean, well, that's, that's by the way. Pick no, the ladder once you get up it. <laughs> as far as, I mean, sorry, maybe Michelle, you wanted to say something there, but as far as differences between you are concerned, mm. I would be far more surprised if there wasn't differences. Frankly, I mean, you're you're from opposite sides of the political spectrum. Sure. In the sake, so it, it, what you're proving is that you have, we'll have these differences, but you can work together for the greater good. And that's what it's about. So fair play to you. Keep it up. That's Thank not you. a question. Yeah. No, fair, fair play, and, and and thanks for that. And um, Doug actually brought this question up, and, and he said he was trying. He loved us all working together, but. but <laughs> 
But um, I mean, my, my views on academic selection, I'm also a part of it. I went to a grammar school, but I still don't agree with it. I, I think it's wrong on, on many, many fronts. I also think that the, the bodies bringing forward, the unregulated bodies bringing forward the tests um, in later in the year should be ashamed of themselves. Children haven't been at school for so, for so long and they won't be in their normal situation come September. We still don't even know what that looks like. Obviously, that's going to have to be worked up. And, you know, I just think that to, to put children through that right now is is just totally unacceptable. So I welcome the comments that were made um, um, by the bishops around uh, asking boards of governors, because boards of governors obviously need to assert their their authority right now. Anyone who sits on a board of governor has a huge responsibility um, to the to the welfare of the children. So I would encourage boards of governors to, to think very carefully about um, about this and, you know, is there another and better way um, things can, can children can move to their to their next um, stage in school? Must be a case for delay at least, you know. Well, anyway, thanks very much. Thanks, okay. uh, Martina. Uh, thank you, thank you for uh, for being here today and, and for your presentation. And also, um, I think the display that we had from both of you in the in the chamber when you announced the five steps uh, was talked about far and wide by many people on on the media. And I think it was what's been discussed here today, that sense of cohesion, um, that you're working together, uh, despite the difference. We all come from five different political ideologies, I suppose, in many respects. But I just want to say, uh, in relation to that, you know, we, we, this is a contested space, as we all know, in a contested place, and we all have our, our differences or whatever. I, I just didn't think that uh, Gavin Robinson's uh, remarks with regards to one's Irishness, uh, I can say as, uh, as, as an Irish Republican, when, and I know you will not say when, but when this country is united, anyone who's British will be British, and, and we will defend the right to be British, and I just didn't think that was helpful uh, for, for him to, to say that. Um, but I do appreciate, appreciate the, the five steps um, pathway that you've outlined and the way you've outlined it, and how you give confidence to people um, that you would not be releasing or relaxing these measures until it's safe to do so. And I think that was a message that was really resonated with people because uh, you have people who are frustrated and want out and then you have another group of people that are saying, look, make sure we don't move fast in the wrong direction. And your leadership is giving them that confidence that you aren't going to move as fast in, in the wrong direction. Um, you'd not be surprised if I asked a question on Brexit. <laughs> and uh, uh, given even the day that that's in it, um, because um, and I appreciate look, he's haven't had time to to consider the uh, the announcement or statement, or and it's only been made today. Um, but it confirms what was the information that was given to this uh, this committee last week by by the two junior ministers that uh, that the British government is going to uh, be implementing the protocol. And today we heard about declarations on goods um, moving from Britain. You'll not be surprised, particularly um, neither of you, but anyone that has heard me say before, Brexit is an unmitigated disaster. And unfortunately, these declarations and the impact it's going to have on business is going to be part of that. But regarding the executive's um, responsibility to design and operate uh, border control posts, uh, here, you know, even if it's in the context that these are going to be an enhancement of what is what's already there, but we're going to need, unfortunately, border control posts because of the implications of Brexit. So it's just uh, do you accept that this is the case, and how is it going to be moved forward, and whose responsibility even? Uh, and I say this as a member of the Infrastructure Committee because I know the Infrastructure Committee has some responsibility around ports, around policy and regulation, but I know that the port operators may have to, say for instance, give this information over to the Agriculture Minister, and then obviously it engages the Minister of the Economy too. So I'm assuming that all of the ministers in the executive uh, will be involved in how this is going to be taken forward. Uh, well, thank you for that, Martina. Uh, obviously, we disagree on, on Brexit uh, and on a number of areas, but I think that the paper that has been set out today um, is quite clear. We've been asking for clarity on all of these issues, and uh, I think there's been some clarity brought today. Of course, we'll continue uh, to work on the technical parts and, and the uh, entry designation uh, for SPS and, and um, 
food uh, animal origin um, matters will of course have to be dealt with. Um, I think the important point in the protocol from what I can see thus far, it talks about very much minimising all of that. I welcome that. Obviously, I didn't like the protocol at all, but that we have to make sure that we minimise it as much as possible. Very pleased to see um, that, again, it talks about the unfettered access uh, from Northern Ireland in, into the rest of the UK market, uh, that there won't be any tariffs paid uh, on goods that are moving between uh, parts of the United Kingdom, uh, that there won't be any new customs infrastructure, uh, that is good news as well, uh, and that, of course, we'll benefit from uh, any uh, new trade deals. Um, I think we will have to work through the technical pieces. As far as I understand it, most of our ports are private ports, um, I think it'll be more an issue for the Department of Agriculture and Rural Affairs, but again, it'll come back to the centre in terms of the Brexit subcommittee and, and the Brexit issue that we have uh, at the executive as to how we move forward, um, working with the UK government in the implementation of the protocol. So there'll be, have to be close working uh, ourselves uh, and Whitehall on all of this. Well, as you said and recognised from the start, um, Sinn Féin are opposed to Brexit. Um, and However, I uh, do believe that uh, the fact that there is at least some more clarity today is, is helpful. Um, and I think that the EU will assess for themselves just the proposals that have been published um, by the British government and they'll have to decide as to whether or not they satisfy um, the, the full implementation of the protocol itself. I um, think that the report, and you're right, it has just been published, so we're working our way through it, but the report itself confirms the British government will be seeking to put in place border control um, posts at ports of entry here for all categories of agri-food um, goods that are coming from Britain and elsewhere from outside the EU. So that's work which the executive are now going to um, have to engage on. I think the fact that we now um, have to consider all these things, but surely um, uh, the full implementation of the protocol is where, where we need to get to. Um, I, I would like to ask a, a another question, but just to say, I think from the engagement that I and, and others have had with business, it's one of the reasons why business is saying that we need an, uh, an extension here because of the few and the belief, and I think they're right, we're not ready. Seven months now left before we get to that point, and I think that's going to, the demand and that is going to grow and increase. I'm just conscious of what was said um, by you both and in the paper about the relaxation of measures when it's safe to do so, and obviously I, I say what I'm going to say here around the economy in the context of public health uh, being uh, pri the priority and people people's um, safety and saving lives. But I'm also uh, would like to ask about the economic uh, recovery challenge because in the paper, and it quite clearly stated, somebody said it was hidden away, there was nothing hidden away about it. It quite clearly stated in the paper that every month was akin uh, to a recession here and we're, and we're now in, in the third month of it. So when we talk about uh, going to rebuild and sustain uh, jobs, um, which is going to be crucially important, particularly the information that you've imparted about the number of people who will likely lose their jobs as a consequence of this pandemic. I want to acknowledge, uh, in the first instance, the uh, executive support for the North West in the Inclusive Growth Fund. Uh, that was received very well in Derry and in the North West. So I, I really do want to acknowledge that. And secondly, to acknowledge that only in a short week, that like all the political parties across the city, we were all on the one page pushing for a decision to be made on the medical school in, in McGee. And the fact that you were able to take it from the probably phone between two stools, take it into to your office and to make that announcement only a few days ago. Um, that was well received by Chamber of Commerce, all of the sectors, and acknowledging all the work that has been done by many, many people um, in, in the city. So I'm very, very conscious um, of that. And it's to ask then in the context of how we're going forward about the kind of relief schemes, you just touched on them, and uh, that's there for people um, as we move out of this around the economic recovery. Um, the amount of finance that has been um, allocated at this moment in time to businesses and to keep people in work. And I think as we come out of this recovery, just how are we going to, that's maybe not going to be sustainable um, forever, 
but we need to be able to look at how we can utilise um, what we have learned if, uh, out of this and how we build on the support for both job creation uh, going forward and a sustainable um, equal economy and, and something that I've heard both of you say which I think is how we plan um, to build the society and the kind of society we build coming out of here hopefully will be different to the one that we've had going into it especially for our health service. So the, the initial response was um, obviously all about response. So if there's three phases to this, a response and then recovery and renewal, and that's how we've come at it in terms of um, all about the public health emergency. Now we're still in the response stage, but we're obviously also moving towards renewal. So we've started some um, conversations around how do you build the economy on the other side of this. And you know the unfortunate reality is that not everybody's going to make it in terms of business um, survival and we're realistic enough to know that but a lot of the schemes that have been brought forward have all been an attempt to try and help people survive it and we also know that some sectors are going to be worse off um, than others hospitality retail tourism um completely um annihilated nearly and if you want to put it that way um in terms of the, the impact <coughs> on them. so a lot of the supports that we've been able to bring forward have been very much um tailored and everything from the rates package announced um initially which was further extended yesterday and particularly targeted towards sectors, um, allows us to provide some support for those hardest hit sectors up until the end of the financial year. Um, child care providers will be able to um, you know, avail of that as well. And then you have a whole um, raft of other different support packages. Also, I think we'll have to be honest enough to say is that not every package, not every, not every business is covered. Some people have fallen through the cracks of the schemes and I'm sure the committee are alert to that. Um, there was an attempt to try and catch um, businesses who have fall, fallen outside the initial schemes with the hardship scheme but we're also feeding, getting feedback to say that doesn't cover everybody also so we have to keep these things keep looking at it and trying to support people um, as best as we can but we have an, an economy to grow or to maintain and to lift out of what has, got, what has been one of the biggest shocks or the biggest shock that that, um, that you have described yourself in terms of the impact of COVID-19 but the focus of the executive will certainly be now to how can we build the economy and we should learn lessons from the work that was being done with the forum which is the labour relations agency the hse the business organizations um, the trade union movement coming together because there's an opportunity then for us all to look at how we can improve um the economy how we can improve how things are done and actually look to see if there's anything that we can do better in the future as well so I think there are some positives that we're going to take from this period and maybe um, use uh, when we're in the recovery and renewal phase. Uh, and I know it's not to everybody's taste, but remote working has been a feature for a lot of people. And how can that work in the future? Do people want to be able to work from home um, two days a week or three days a week? You know, it may actually also help Martina with something which I know you and I, Michelle, are very interested in, and that is the regional dispersal of jobs across Northern Ireland. Uh, in Definitely. terms of allowing people perhaps to have mm. their office somewhere but working uh, mm -hmm. from home um, and that I think is a positive. Um, we have actually now as of yesterday's announcements about rates, the most uh, generous rates relief uh, across the United Kingdom. Uh, I think that's something that wasn't really picked up uh, because we've given a rates holiday to everybody for four months and then we've targeted it. Uh, for the rest of the financial year. Uh, that's not the case in other parts. It was targeted right from the beginning and not everybody uh, got a rates holiday. So I think we should recognise that and recognise the funding that we have received uh, from the Treasury in London uh, and the way in which then we have uh, been able to tailor it uh, to Northern Ireland. And Michelle's right, we haven't been able to capture everybody uh, in those schemes uh, and no doubt we'll be looking to see who has been left out. Now the hardship fund comes online I think tonight at, at six o'clock um, to see who has been left outside of that hardship fund and to see if there's any way we can intervene to help those uh, people as well. But look there's a, there's a lot of learning mm. and there's also experience from across the world. People, Countries who are ahead of us in terms of the transmission of the virus, how are they coming out? How are they dealing uh, with the difference, so New Zealand, South Korea, places like that, what are they doing different um, and can we look uh, to emulate some of that and put it into our um, package of moving forward because I, when I was economy minister it was always about 
we were small enough, you know, to care about our whole uh, economy and our whole society, but big enough to do the business, but small enough to actually care about what was going on. Uh, so we should use that flexibility and the fact that everybody knows everybody else to actually try and make a difference uh, for Northern Ireland as we come out uh, of this, what has been the strangest and most difficult of times for a lot of, an awful lot of people. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher. Thank you. Um, pennies don't fall from heaven, they have to be earned. And once this is over, yep. we're going to need to have an economy at the end of it. Um, one of the big things that I appreciate it's not the central um, driving element in determining the speed at which uh, these draconian laws are relaxed, but one of the central elements of it is the R number. Can I ask what the R number presently is? Yeah, so the R number fluctuates uh, from today, today, Christopher, and what we're really interested in is the trend of the R number over uh, a week's period. So what we will be trying to do at the end of each week is look at where the R number has been that week and look at the impact uh, that the relaxation has had on the R number. We won't know that for probably a couple of weeks uh, in terms of the impact the, the, the it has, because the R number looks at... ICU admissions, it looks at uh, admissions to hospitals, uh, it looks at all of those things and as you will have heard from the Health Minister, the ICU numbers have thankfully fallen well down now. Um, so that allows us then to make some of the relaxations that we've made. So I'm not giving you a figure for the R number in case you haven't figured it out yet, uh, but we will be talking about where it is at um, towards the end of the week in terms of the trend over this week. The ICU numbers didn't fall in the Stalford household. I had to miss the Economy Committee today because my son stood on a piece of glass and had to Aww. pull out of his foot. But okay. apart, apart from that, um, so the R number, has any indication been given of what the premium or best R value should be to allow further relaxation of the measures? It's not just the R number, it's also about the number of cases in, society, in, in, in Northern Ireland at the time. Do you want to pick that up? Yeah, so it's, you can get fixated on a figure, so I know that people say, well, if it gets to 0.5, does that mean mm. we can go? It doesn't work like that. You have to build in enough um, space, because you're trying to keep it below one. That's, that's, the, that's the objective, keep yeah. it always below one. Um, whenever you lift measures, it takes about 14 days to three weeks before mm. you actually see the impact of the spread which would obviously bring it back up. So you could start today and say we're lifting... To, sorry, I should say we opened up garden centres and recycling centres. You won't know the impact of that until about 14 days. Um, so, or at, at the start of that could be, at, say, for example, it was at 0.5, but by whenever you measure again at that stage, it could be at 0.8, 0.9. So all you have to do is keep having enough flexibility in there to allow you to have the space to grow because the virus will grow and come down and grow and come down. Um, so we're allowing ourselves enough space, but it isn't just that. It has to be. That's the that's the main science behind it. But you have to look at then the, th the three things that we talked about: how you measure um, the health service capacity, how you measure um, uh, the societal impacts, the impacts on individuals. So we set out a matrix, which is the risk-based matrix, which looks at um, everything, at each restriction, and then measures it. So where does it sit on the scale at any given time? And then the science tries to tell us how much of an impact they, that may have on the R factor. In terms of the, the final end stage, getting to the very end, um, how many weeks do you think the R number would need to be consistently below one before we got to that point? Because the, the whole approach is incremental and gradual, I, don't, I actually don't know if you can, you can measure it in terms of where we'd be, because we don't know how the virus is going to spread. Yeah. No, you'd be what you'd be you'd be wrong actually to say, well, we could get there in three weeks' time. You could make a best guess at it, but it depends on how the virus behaves, and that's depending on how people behave. And it's so also and it's also the fact that we're going to have the contact tracing mm. in at that stage, so we'll have much more information about how many cases there are, because you know there are many people out there in our society chair who are asymptomatic. They've had COVID-19. They haven't really even realised they've had COVID-19, but they may have been carrying it to somebody else. And, and that's the problem. Uh, and that's why we need this tracing piece, which lies inside, uh, alongside the economic recovery piece and our step-by-step -step plan. So it's all integrated uh, together so that we can move forward. And I think that's the way we want to go. Over the course of the last period of time, a lot of uh, amateur epidemiologists have emerged. And um, I'm now going to play one. Um, <laughs> From what evidence we have seen, 
there seems to be an indication, I think this is fair, I can say this without fear of contradiction, that those least at risk are younger people, while those disproportionately more at risk are older people or, or people in the middle age with, who are diabetic. If that is the case, by what logic do we continue? Hello, George. If that is the case, by what logic do we continue to keep the schools closed? Well, first of all, I want to say this to you, Christopher. This is novel coronavirus. So we're learning all the time. Mm. Look at the impact this disease has had on people of an ethnic origin mm. across the water. I mean, it's been absolutely incredible the, the way it has just spread uh, and in, in a really devastating way. Look at the impact it's having on people who are obese. Um, you're right to mention the elderly. That's absolutely the case. Um, and the Education Minister will come forward with his proposals on all of this uh, in the very near future. I think he's coming to the Executive very soon with a paper on the reopening of schools. And look, it's about giving confidence to parents as well, because parents, and you are one of them, are very, very worried about their children. And uh, at the start, people wanted us to close schools very, very quickly because they were very worried about their children being carriers or suffering from it. Uh, it looks now as if the evidence is that children don't suffer uh, in a particular way from it, and quite the opposite, actually. Mm. So how can we then open the schools in a safe way? Planning for that will take some time. It'll not be too long before we're at the 1st of June. And is it realistic to open schools again before the summer? Uh, maybe not have all the planning done, or would it not be better to do all of that planning and then be able to come back afresh into a new school year uh, at the end of August, beginning of September, and people can then start in, as opposed to bringing them back off for holidays and then coming back again. Those are the things the Education Minister has to grapple with. Um, I, I hear what you're saying about children. I understand it. Uh, but we have to move in, in the way that we think is best for Northern Ireland and we'll take all the advice that we can on that, even from amateur epidemi epidemiologists. <laughs> I can assure you, as a, as, a, as a father of four under the age of 10, You're not trying to get, to get them out of the house, I can <laughs> promise you that. But I'm just wondering if, uh, running through all the various matrices and tests that there are, um, it was shown that schools could be... Or do you think that there's any scope or time in July and August to allow children to catch up? Because I understand, like, I've been doing some the teaching and Laura's been doing some of the teaching at school, but it's not as good as, obviously, no. it's not, it can never be. So I'm just wondering, is there any scope, or do you think, for July and August, time to be used for the children to catch up with what they've, they've missed out on? Well, I, I think that's something the Education Minister will have to consider. Look, I think, I've already indicated in, in response to Trevor that there are kids who will do okay, but there are some children who haven't had the support um, and we just have to acknowledge that and then we have to think of how we can give them yeah. that support and intervene um, and that's something that the Education Minister will have to consider. Just to add, I mean, as you acknowledge yourself, you're not a scientist, nor, nor am I. Mm. <laughs> but I, I think that there's no doubt that children are, are, can carry it and I think yeah. that's, that's still a, a big concern. I also think that parents right now are thinking, what does this look like in September? That's, that's the question that's on your mind. People are worried. One, they're worried, obviously, because you're naturally about the children being, not having their, their education mm. um, in the way in which they normally do. But secondly, what does September look like? It's the end of August, September. What does that look like? So there need, quickly needs to be that piece of work done with, um, within the Department of Education, working with the teaching unions, um, parents, groups, whatever, whatever that forum looks like. But I certainly think that we need to start to, 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 to paint out very clearly for people what does it look like? Mm. Because is it going to mean different cohorts going on different days? That's even a challenge for a family. Like, how do you manage your childcare? How do you manage um, all of that? You might have so you have four children. Um, that could be at school on different days. What does that mean as for that for the family unit? So, um, these are things that, that I know the parents will very quickly um, turn their mind to for, for what does that look like for September. So, uh, I welcome the fact that the education minister will bring a plan around that. But certainly, I think it's um, it, people should work on the basis that it's going to be that end of August, September sort of period for us to be able to do this. Because I also think there's practical things that need to happen. The schools maybe need to adjust. How do you socially distance in a school? Mm. School toilets, shared spaces, um, all those things need to all have to, there's probably a substantive amount, amount of work that actually needs to happen there. And we need to use this time to get it ready. Well, you, I mean, you mentioned boards of governors, and I'm on the board of governors of the school that my children go to. And I mean, it's a 1950s building, you know, 
just making it practical is you're absolutely right about that. Can I raise an issue about churches? Many churches in inner city areas in Belfast, they don't have car parks. But they have enormous buildings that were put up at the turn of the 20th century. Now they were maybe put up at a time when they had two and a half thousand of a congregation and yeah. now they have 200 of a congregation. And I, I think, think of the, my own church, Ravenhill Presbyterian. Our congregation could be accommodated in our building in the way that we're being accommodated here in this committee room. And I'm just wondering, is there any plans on that? Or is there any idea even in terms of putting a scheme in place whereby if a church has a big building, but not a huge congregation, I mean we're healthy enough, but not a huge one, that could be accommodated in the space that they have in a socially distanced way? Because you know yourself, you know yourself, it's really important for people, particularly older people, that sense of community that the church gives. Well, look, uh, Christopher, we have been engaging very much with the church leaders in recognition of the role that faith plays in Northern Ireland. Um, I personally very much miss church, I miss singing, I miss all of that in a congregational way. But there's also the realisation that I, I said to Trevor about shared services, that's the problem in churches. When you bring people into churches, and even if you bring 20 people into a huge building, they're still in a, uh, in a situation where they may be touching shared services. And to be fair to the churches, I think they are very much wanting to work with us. They are wanting to find solutions. We're listening very carefully to what they're telling us about their regimes in terms of cleaning and all of that. Um, and we will continue to work with them. I mean, our medical advice tells us that we can't allow f a family to meet uh, indoors. We can allow people to meet outdoors because mm. outdoors the virus doesn't spread as uh, as rapidly, but indoors it does. And, and therefore we have to take that advice, Christopher, as much as we would like to get back into a situation of people going to, uh, to, to their Sunday services um, uh, and indeed other services. We just have to try and work through this and find solutions. But we will keep talking uh, to church leaders and trying to find solutions. We have, as you know, uh, facilitated the private prayer now. We have said you can have uh, drive-in uh, church services, not drive-through church <laughs> services. Uh, but uh, I, I understand there is some little difficulty now about broadcasting rights in terms of having spectrum to, to be able to do the drive-in piece. So that's another little challenge that has popped up now. So uh, there's all of these things that we can't foresee, uh, but we're working our way through them uh, and we'll continue to talk to the churches about it. I mean, I've been contacted. There's another church just up the road from uh, Ravenhill. Sorry. 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 Hello? If someone hasn't got their name yet, and there's slight feedback, you can barely get a second. You, you, just two more questions. Two? Okay. Yeah. Who, who else? Have okay, so I, I tell you what it is, it's somebody on the phones is watching the live stream which is on in the background and that's about 20 seconds behind what we're doing here so we're hearing what we're saying but with a 20 second delay so... Um, <laughs> but, sure, you say about my four questions, I've had four without a preamble. Yeah, <laughs> get on with it. <laughs> um, in terms of the idea of a, an extension to the transition period. Mm. In such an extension, the UK would continue to pay 11 billion net into the EU, is that right? That is correct, and that, that's why I raised the issue with costs. But look, uh, we're not going to have a meeting of minds in relation to the Brexit transition in this committee. Uh, oh. I think Michelle and I are happy to come back to talk about Brexit uh, mm. on another occasion. That's fine. Good man, thank you. Because we do need to move the phones. I'm balancing a couple of um, difficult tensions here because we've another three people on the phones to, to ask questions but we probably also have two representatives from the Community Relations Council that we're expecting to give us a report at three o'clock when we should have left have a fair bit longer for, for yourselves. And we have a meeting to go to as well. And you have a meeting to go to. <laughs> yeah. And I, I dislike having to ask the people on the phone at the end to be any quicker with their questions but could I ask George do you have a question at all there? Yes, yes, I do indeed sir, yes. And I'm uh, going to thank the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister for their presentation and to also commend their executive colleagues for the sterling work that they're all doing on our behalf. A um, couple of questions. The first one is in relation to have the executive had any discussions with the Irish League Football Association in relation to the season uh, ending or continuing or what, what exactly has happened? There's about roughly about ten matches 
you know, each of the clubs had to play yet. And the, the season is actually officially over. But I was wondering, has there been an extension granted or have they had any discussions with the Irish FA just exactly what's, <coughs> what's happened to Irish League football? That's my first question. And the second one is in relation to the testing situation. Now, maybe this has been answered because um, the phone has been terrible. <laughs> There's the noise and sound has been absolutely atrocious. You can hardly hear you know, people speaking. But I'll mention the, the second one anyway. It's from a testing point of view. Um, will there be testing done you know, to the care home staff, carers, ambulance crews, etc.? Um, and in fact, all NHS staff. Uh, we, we've seen what has happened, you know, in the care, in the care homes, and uh, I think this this would be very ad- advantageous that uh, all care, all NHS staff is tested, you know, in the future. And is is that will that take place? That's my two questions. Thank you, George. Okay, George. So I understand the junior ministers have been speaking to uh, the three sporting codes, um, the FA, the GAA, and uh, uh, the IRFU Ulster branch in relation to a range of issues. So we'll certainly ask them: Have they any update in relation to Irish League football? Of course, it, it probably is a is a matter for Deidre uh, in the department for for communities uh, because she has the sport remit. But we'll take that away and try and get you an answer in relation to that. Mm-hmm. In terms of the care home situation, the Minister of Health has announced uh, universal testing for residents and uh, the staff. I understand that it sits about 40% in terms of the residents now and has been ramped up every day. Uh, Other key workers can avail of testing at the national testing sites. Uh, George, if they present uh, there, they can get a test uh, if they need one. Okay. Happy enough there, George. Can we move? Uh, can we come on with another wee sup- quick supplementary? Yes. And I know Pat had mentioned it earlier on in relation to the funerals, funeral situation. And I think the sooner that that's sort of resolved, the, the better. And do you appreciate the reasons why, you know, from the social distancing and so forth? And it's a very, very emotive uh, situation. Um, it's just that I've got a text in the last couple of hours there in relation to a funeral here that happened in Limavari and <clears throat> apparently there was about 100 people at it um, and o- other people, you know, there's, there's people in care homes has died and there's only about 10 you know, allowed at, at the funeral whereas this funeral today there's roughly anything up to 100 apparently at it, so people are starting to ask, ask me questions, why? <laughs> Some people, George, find a way to pay their respects by standing on the side of the road as the cortege goes past. Um, and if, as long as people socially distance, there's no difficulty with that. But there certainly shouldn't be that amount of people at the graveside. Um, and, and that certainly should not be the case. They walk, they walk right from the house, you know, uh, <coughs> to the graveyard. Right. Okay. Well, the whole, whole maybe you'd like to take that up with us. Mind. Maybe you'd like to take that up with us offline, George. That's okay. fine. Yeah, that's right. Thanks very much. Thanks okay. very much. Okay, uh, Emma, you join next. Have you a question? Yes, yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks to the Minister for the presentation. And I would echo there what George has said in relation to care homes and the fact that it's sort of been the disproportionate, uh, disproportionately affected in all of this and are the front line. But uh, I just wanted to ask a question uh, about the future going forward in terms of the, the stakeholders forum that was convened uh, under the Labour Relations Group. Um, it seems to have worked well during the crisis, and I, I'm wondering if there is a plan there to use the same model to bring everyone, employers, workers, reps, government together in terms of the economic recovery out of this and, and how that's navigated. I don't, I don't think, Emma, we've had a, a full conversation about that, but I certainly know that the Economy Minister is currently engaging with the forum around uh, the advice from the UK Department to see if there's anything extra that we need to add in from a Northern Ireland perspective. So she is engaging with that forum at the moment, um, and it's obviously something that we'll continue to discuss at the Executive. Yeah, and just um, for George and, and for yourself again, just to concur with the, the commentary around nursing homes, care homes, that has to be where we're all focused and I welcome the fact that there has been some improvements. We also we listen very carefully to the comments of you know people like the older persons commissioner to, to Eddie Lynch and 
uh, we met with him last week and, and listened just very intently around the concerns that have been expressed. So, um, as it's been described about the battle being in our care homes, then that's where we need to be um, very much focused. And I want to commend all the staff of care homes because this has been a really, really, really trying time for them. And you know, we talk, we clap every Thursday for our carers, and you know, we we're, we're so appreciative. Um, but I'm quite sure those people have felt overwhelmed at, at times in the middle of all of this. So just to put on record our thanks to all the staff of care homes. Um, and, and on the stakeholder forum, I think it's a really good example just of how you can bring all the partners together. Um, so I think certainly in a, a meeting I had yesterday with the Chamber of Commerce, um, they were um, raising the fact that, that the collective um, approach to these things is, is very helpful. And um, if we can do more of that, I think it would be a really good thing. Okay, you happy enough, Emma? Yes. <laughs> yes, thanks for that. Okay, um, Trevor. Then finally, have you um, any questions, sir? Yeah, yes, please, sir. Um, like others, can I thank the first the first minister for what has been said today, and indeed for what work the executive have done, have done over the last number of weeks. Um, Arling, you, you had mentioned at one stage there about the the furlough payments, and I agree with you. I think uh, we would have been in a very different place in terms of the people who are employed had the Tory government not been so generous with some of the funding that has been brought forward. Um, but like the chairman, there's always a but. Um, the self-employed are still a wee bit anxious that they are only benefiting from the tune of the three-month period. So some are saying to us, well, I have to continue to furlough my employees for up to August, September or October. However, they're not receiving any payments beyond June. Are the executives making any representations on behalf of the self-employed to try and, try and address that anomaly? And indeed, then, some of those self-employed, the smaller ones, I know the micro scheme is out, but some of the smaller uh, businesses are saying, well, where they're only employing themselves, that, again, they have missed this because there's no opportunity for them. So they have missed the rate scheme, and they're missing this one. And, and, I mean, and I'm saying this with a caveat that I know the executive have listened and have made lots of adjustments to other schemes, so I'm wondering, do they envisage an adjustment to this particular scheme to help those? I think there's a couple of things, Trevor. We do recognise that any scheme will have its limits. Um, we, I mean, as MLAs, uh, we are always contacted by those who aren't captured by uh, a particular scheme, and uh, we have to try and find ways in which to help those people, and that's what we've been trying to do through the various schemes that we have announced. But undoubtedly, there are still some people that we haven't been able to capture, uh, and it's, a, it's a, an ongoing piece of work. Uh, in terms of the self-employed um, Westminster uh, scheme, uh, yes, we continue to make representations in relation to that issue. Uh, I suppose it depends on which sector you are in relation to the self-employed piece, because uh, some people will be going back to work in a tentative fashion, and therefore the question is, do they need to have the self-employed scheme there? I think it's just a question of what particular sector you're in, whether you need that continued support, or whether you can actually go out uh, and do your work. Okay, and, and thank you for that. And I suppose the other one now, as, and as you've said, some are going back to work. Uh, the, other, the other ones that are contacting, and certainly I'm getting contacts from, are those who are actually care, 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 care providers, particularly the small, more independent ones. And they're saying, as people go back to work, what's the position for them in terms of providing child care for those who are not seen as essential workers. Uh, I mean, there was provision clearly made at the start of the process for them, but the, the small child care providers now are saying what they do now, that their uh, children they have been providing for previously, that the parents are going back to work. Yeah, it's so, Trevor, I think this is a, a challenge. I mean, we've talked about schools, we've talked about people returning to work, but the key to all of this is having the appropriate child care in place to facilitate people to do all of these things. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, we have a child care rates relief scheme. Uh, I don't think that's available anywhere else. Um, and that's a recognition of the key work uh, that the child care sector does. But if you're talking about child registered child minders in their own home, um, that is a matter, I think, for the Department of Health in relation to how many children they can keep and what the advice is. So we'll take that away to the Department of Health and try to get a bit of clarity in relation to the child care issue in respect of registered child care. Okay, appreciate that. Okay, um, thank you very much indeed. Ministers, thank you for giving us your time. You've given us thank more you. time than we had asked for today, but if we were going to be talking about COVID and, and the associated issues, it probably should have 
set a bit longer for it. Um, I know you've raised a whole load of issues there as well in relation to the issue of Brexit. I think maybe we'll come back to you and give a full dedicated time to that rather than it being something that we're referring to otherwise. Chair, uh, just, just before we finish, uh, and I do want to make this good news story in terms of the historical institutional abuse, oh, yeah, yeah. we have been able to make some payments in relation to that scheme and we've written to you today. We will be making a press release on that today. We think that is good news. It shows that even despite the whole COVID uh, issue that the panel has met and the panel has made uh, announcements. So we really, the two of us, very much are very pleased about that. And I'm sure you are as well, because I know that this committee has kept a very tight eye in relation to this issue. Well, th thank you very much for mentioning that as well. And that it is appreciated. And I know that, that, that people will be very happy with that. So we, we extend thanks for that and, and look forward to seeing that Good continue enough. in this time. So thank you very much for that. Um, and if you could please extend to the rest of the executive ministers the thanks that was um, sort of stated here earlier, and um, thank you very much indeed. Thank thanks you. very much. Thank, thank you, you, Andrew. Stay safe. And we we'll take just. Thank you. <coughs> so, members, we'll power on. Um, that bit. I give people as much latitude as possible there because it is an important issue and it was an, an opportunity to speak with the First and Deputy First Minister and I'm sure that our next two guests will uh, understand why we, if we were going to have to delay them for anybody and um, delaying them for the First and Deputy First Minister was uh, a reasonable grounds for that. So if I could take the opportunity to welcome uh, Jacqueline Irwin, the Chief Executive of the Community Relations Council and Martin MacDonald, the Chair of the uh, Community Relations Council. Can I just check that you're both there online with us? Yes, yes Chair. Okay. Yes. Uh, maybe I will I be passing over then to Martin. Okay, Chair, thank you. Uh, yes, we fully understand uh, the length of time it's taken to, to deal with First and Deputy First Minister. Very critical issues and it's, and it's proper to, to allocate the amount of time you have done. So no problem from our perspective. Uh, from what, what we intend to do, what I intend to do at this stage is to, well, first of all, to thank you for the opportunity to give evidence to the committee on the work of the Community Relations Council. I've been chair of the organisation for about a year now. Uh, I was appointed by the Executive Office last June, along with eight new board members, two of whom had served previously on CRC. Uh, in terms of my other roles, I'm also a director on the Southern Health and Social Care Trust obviously closely involved in the whole COVID side and the Northern Ireland Fisheries Harbour Authority and obviously COVID has hit our, our, our fishing industry and our fishing ports as well. So there's no sector really, including the good relations sector, that hasn't been impacted by this. But if the committee's content, I'll give a, a general outline of CRC's work and Jacqueline, our Chief Executive Officer, will then present you with some more detailed observations and information indeed how we have been managing through the COVID-19 emergency. By, by way of background, um, and for those members who may be unfamiliar with the work of CRC, we provided a paper in advance of this presentation, and members will see that in section two of the paper, uh, it includes a brief overview of our vision, strategic priorities, and the functions of the organisation. Uh, I suppose it's, it's important to say that the organisation is at a juncture. We've just come to the end of our last strategic plan and the opening of a new one, which covers the period 2020 to 2023. And the public consultation period for that new plan closed on the 3rd of April 2020, and the board's now finalising the plan. And while I say finalising, obviously our sector will also have to pick up a lot of learning from the, the current COVID pandemic, and I've no doubt that adjustments as to how we do business will, will have an impact and should be included within our next three-year strategic period. This year is also our 30th anniversary, and to give members of the committee a view of our work from the perspective of those who use our services, we've provided a video link uh, which will be operational to the 27th of May, and, and that gives will give the committee a perspective of those people we've engaged with, those people we have funded, and what that their views are and have been about CRC and the role that we have performed. The briefing paper we sent you also outlines two broad delivery methods and both of those are equally important. The first in section three of the, uh, is the organization's funding programs on behalf of the executive office. The second in section four is our community engagement work. And as part of that engagement, we provide development support. We identify and share best practice and we facilitate wide community engagement. 
on, on what we consider to be effective approaches to peace building and good shared community relationships. In terms of the work we do, it's not always about uh, giving out grant data. It's, it's about being available either at a time of a crisis or to deal with a particular problem and offering tools and techniques uh, to find solutions to those problems. In Section 5, we've made some observations derived from our own work, and in Section 6, we've provided you with information on how we are continuing or attempting to continue to deliver as best we can our services during, during the COVID emergency. CRC is an arm's length body of the Executive Office and a delivery agent of the Executive's uh, T-Box strategy, transforming and building a united community. Our council was established back in 1990 as a company limited by guarantee and a registered charity to lead and support change towards reconciliation, tolerance and mutual trust and to be a catalyst for good inter-community and indeed intercultural relationships in the region. And in terms of where we are now, this, this last year has, has been a big cultural change for the organisation, having moved into a formal arms and length body structure. Previously, it, it straddled the line between being an independent organisation that could challenge and indeed often criticise government approaches. But clearly, there's a, there's a big shift in terms of what we do. Policy is now set by the Executive Office. We're here as a delivery agent. In terms of how we influence policy, it's by the evidence we gather it through our engagement and through our funding programs. We feed that back to, to the Executive Office. So we're not benign in terms of trying to influence policy, but we do it in a more structured uh, and evidence-based fashion. As I mentioned, uh, we are currently in completing our work on the new, on the new plan, which sets out uh, a vision for what's a diverse, shared and interconnected society and its values which stress human dignity as, as the fundamental basis for good community relations. The values are listed and explained in the paper under the headings interconnectedness, diversity, equity, equality, respect and dignity. The common good, openness, transparency uh, and accountability are, are, are important as part of our work. Uh, also included in the briefing paper are three strategic priorities, which will give the committee members information on our contribution to sustainable development, well-being and the common good. And there's particular emphasis uh, on the goal of embedding and normalising good community relationships in everyday life. I can look back and reflect upon this. A lot of extraordinary work has been done by CRC in over 30 years in terms of good relations and community relations. I think what we're now moving to is to make that extra, those extraordinary efforts part of everyday life. And that, that's the goal and the objective of our new strategy to really embed it across the government system. The second main strategic priority is about supporting effective delivery and learning, and finally, continuing to be a well-governed and trusted public service. The vision and strategic priorities are designed to support the programme for government whenever we get that, and also the TBUC strategy and Appendix 1 of the briefing document contains specific indicators and outcomes to which the, the work of CRC itself contributes. The organisation has put a lot of effort into helping link the work that we fund at a community level to the strategic outcomes set by government under TBUC, and we, we operate under an outcomes-based approach, which, which is designed into both our, our grant application process and assessment, our performance monitoring and our evaluation processes. A full review of our overall performance, along with our annual reports, uh, can, our annual accounts can be found in our annual report. And the full record of our grant funding is also found on the website and, again, in the annual reports. For the purposes of, of this briefing, uh, I now ask Jacqueline to, to draw out some key points from our work in the 2018-19 period, which was our last full audit of the year. So over to you, Jacqueline. Thank you, um, Martin. Good afternoon, committee. Um, if committee members are content, I'll start with funding, which is in section three of your briefing paper. Grant distribution is central to the work of the Community Relations Council. In our last annual report for the financial year ending 31st of March 2019, we distributed almost uh, £2.5 million to 177 organisations. We have six funding streams, as you'll have seen in the briefing paper, and the details and purpose of each is set out also in your paper. Our core fund is the largest, with uh, 1.3 million uh, given towards the salary and running costs of 32 organisations. This investment was spread all across Northern Ireland and delivered funding for 61 posts, 99 projects, 
353 locations and it impacted over 34,000 people. Details of the other schemes are in your paper. For now, I just want to draw your attention to the North Belfast Strategic Good Relations Programme as it is slightly different from the others. The purpose of the programme is to improve relations within communities in North Belfast through the work of 11 contract holders. This is a ministerial intervention which CRC has administered at the request of the Executive Office since 2016. The strategy responsibility for that programme remains with the Executive Office and the structure and funding of the programme is also set by TEO. In the briefing paper, you will also see a chart of the distribution of funding across the region by council area. There's also a table with the, with the uh, data set out. Um, although around 60% of the funding is awarded to organisations delivering projects in Belfast City Council area, it is important to point out here that the North Belfast scheme forms a significant part of that with a total investment of £670,000. Areas with low grant applications tend to be the same for most funders, and we work with the Executive Office and with District Councils and other funders to run funding fairs and information sessions to encourage greater take-up. Uh, if the committee's content, I'll turn to our engagement work briefly. Um, that you'll find that information in section four of your paper. Organisations that receive funding from CRC participate in an annual programme of shared learning events. Additionally, information is circulated to networks of email subscribers through monthly event bulletins, quarterly newsletters, and through our website and social media channels. In 2018-19, our website had 36,000 135 sessions, and that involved 83,719 page views. Facebook and Twitter are also used to communicate our activity and the activity that our funded groups undertake, and we've given you details of that usage in your briefing paper. To support engagement between government and the community and voluntary sector, CRC also delivers the TBUC engagement forum three times per year on behalf of the Executive Office. As members probably know, the objectives of that forum are to enable government and its associated bodies to update the sector on progress in implementing the TBUC strategy, but also to enable the sector to address implementation issues, identify good practice, and make practical recommendation, uh, recommendations for improved delivery. CRC has delivered 12 meetings of the forum across the region since they started in March 2016. Um, we've had 1,860 participants. We've moved the locations and themes regularly, and that has encouraged participation. And each forum attracts an average of 150 people, and that will include first-time attenders, community practitioners, policymakers, and academics. So there remains a very sustained level of interest in building a united community. We were very pleased to welcome the junior ministers at the last meeting of the forum. A list of all the engagement form is included in your uh, briefing pack. The next one is due to take place on the 15th of September. That's during Good Relations Week. We're investigating options to move the engagement forum online if the emergency restrictions related to COVID-19 remain in place. As many members will know, we also run the annual Good Relations Week to showcase good practice and encourage wider engagement. It normally takes place in September. And that's in the week that will include the International Day of Peace. Um, we normally have an average of around 200 events. CRC leads on the planning for the week and the related publicity. We also convene the steering group for the week, which consists of uh, members from the Executive Office, the Department for Communities, the Department for Justice, the Education Authority, Libraries and um, Cathedral Quarter Trust. Planning for this year's Good Relations Week is already underway, but we are considering different ways of delivering it if the social distancing requirements remain largely as they are now. We also make an annual Good Relations Award. Again, we have included details of that in your paper. In the briefing paper, there's also information on two projects organised by CRC, which may be of interest to the committee. First is the Decade of Centenaries project, and that's run in collaboration with the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And the second is the Peace Monitoring Report. 
Members may know that the Decade Project explores ways to engage with commemoration and to ensure that our divided past does not undermine our ability to build a shared future. Members may be aware of the principles for remembering which were developed and widely distributed. Um, they're included in your briefing pack. Uh, CRC and Heritage Fund host a Decade of Centenaries Roundtable, which is a multi-agency initiative to develop and share ideas and information. The Roundtable has also organised many events. Members will find details and resources related to all of that activity on our website. Turning to the Peace Monitoring Report, it was developed by CRC in 2012. It's independently funded by the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust. It's also independently authored, and the author's work is reviewed by an independent advisory group. The first report was published in February 2012, and five reports have been produced to date. The report measures progress towards or away from peace under four dimensions, as many members may know. Firstly, safety and security. Secondly, equality. Thirdly, political progress. And, and um, the last category is cohesion and sharing. The reports are available to download from our website, and the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust has awarded funding for a further two reports. In addition to our own work, CRC's expertise is sometimes called on by colleagues in the Executive Office to assist a number of initiatives and delivery structures there, including TBOC thematic subgroups and assessment panels, TEO grant scheme assessments and other projects, and I've listed some of them in the briefing paper. The strong connections we have made at community level and the TBOC engagement forum give us the opportunity to hear very directly from many people. In our briefing paper, we've provided some information on the issues that regularly arise from the work. You'll find that in section five of the paper, and I'll just touch on a few of them very briefly now. Firstly, there's a recognition of the need to link good community relationships with newly emerging priorities and issues. We hear very often about the work in which community relations changes over time in response to need and opportunities and new priorities. Some of these new priorities affect all sections of society and therefore provide an opportunity for working together. Um, an example would be the environment and, and climate issues. There's also a recognition for the need to adapt and refresh the language around good relations, terms such as the common good, narrative hospitality, generosity, kindness, and so on, are beginning to emerge more now as ways of describing what the work we're trying to do. Um, leadership remains a hugely important issue across all of society, and the need for setting a good example is regularly raised, be that parents, teachers, or influencers in the public, private, or community sectors. Political leadership is always highly valued, along with practical and public demonstrations of commitment to the TBUC ethos. Members won't be surprised to hear that there's a long-standing plea for multi-annual funding streams to provide reliable, secure support and uh, stability for community relations work. In other words, moving away from short-term project activity into more sustainable everyday life, as was mentioned by Martin earlier on. Linked, of course, to that is the need for greater investment in measuring long-term impact. We have, been, we have an increasingly diverse society and more fluid views of identity. Uh, people are less willing to be identified as simply one thing or another. Um, so there is an increasing need to encourage participation and ensure that TBOC outcomes are widely shared across the community. Community safety also remains an issue in some areas. Uh, so any remaining safety and security issues must be reliably tackled to engender trust and the conditions for people to live, work and play together at all levels of society. This may also help us to deal with some of the fear of change that still persists. Another issue that's regularly mentioned is the need for greater collaboration between funders to coordinate activity and develop a more holistic response to overall investment. This includes practical things such as coordination of reporting templates across funders. But to encourage this, we also need to find ways to recognise the contributions of the many different agencies and funders that might be involved in that sort of a collaborative approach. 
Lastly, I'll just touch on learning. Um, learning from experience remains highly valued. Uh, there's continued interest in structured links to share learning and ground practice in theory so that it can be passed on. There's also a concern that many people with experience are leaving community relations work, either due to job insecurity or retirement or other uh, reasons. Their knowledge and expertise takes time to build and replace. And due to the financial insecurity of the sector, the gap is getting harder to fill. We will need to plan for this to sustain skills and standards. If the committee is content now, I'll just briefly touch on how we have re responded to the challenge of COVID-19. This is covered in uh, more detail in section six of your briefing paper. We've also placed details of our working arrangements on our website and we update that information regularly. CRC staff have been working from home since Thursday the 19th of March as part of our emergency plan and in line with the government guidance. All staff have laptops, phones and access to files and emails uh, which enables them to work as normally as possible and our phone calls to CRC reception and emails continue to be answered in the normal way. However, all physical attendance at meetings and events has been cancelled in line with government restrictions and in the meantime most meetings are taking place remotely using Zoom or other uh, online platforms. We're also looking at the option for running larger scale events, including the TBUC Engagement Forum and Good Relations Week, using teleconferencing technology if that becomes necessary. We were really fortunate that our grant administration procedures were already online. But in addition to that, we have advised all funded groups to, um, of our temporary arrangements, which we hope will help them when they're uh, to electronically submit such things as progress reports and financial claims. The groups we fund are finding many new ways to sustain connections during the COVID-19 social restrictions. In the briefing paper, we've included some examples, such as working on frontline services, delivering food parcels, the development of podcasts, online programs, training and activity to keep communities connected, including stress management, cookery, arts and crafts, also rural projects, collecting stories of how people have dealt with the pandemic. Um, and some groups are using video clips to raise awareness of work and to connect program participants and funders. And there are even virtual tours. Uh, more information on all of that can be found on the website and social media channels of the organizations mentioned in the briefing paper. But as an example of that, I just wanted to close with uh, some information that I received. Uh, late last night, uh, but it was actually very heartening. It related to um, a North Belfast food bank programme. So we have nine organisations that are jointly coordinating food banks across North Belfast and the Shankill area. The groups take referrals from elected reps from local council and from Sure Start, amongst others. Um, so there are a total of 50 volunteers from across North Belfast working on that programme. The programme supports the production and delivery of 10,000 COVID-19 directories, providing key contacts and information for those in need. There were 550 packs delivered to hostels, sheltered accommodation, 900 homeless packs delivered across Belfast, 450 packs delivered to those shielding because of underlying health conditions. There are 200 um, um, meals served a day at a North Belfast uh, kitchen. 130 older people are receiving fresh meals provided by local businesses, with 50 vulnerable adults receiving three meals a day. There are 996 family food hampers delivered, and 1,000 sunflower kits delivered as part of the North Belfast in Bloom challenge. This group, or uh, this um, Nine, a series of nine groups have also organised rubbish skips for, for local areas. So and the volunteers who are working on those programmes are working across traditional boundaries to meet daily needs in whatever community requires them. So I think that's a great example of a community response to a very, very unusual sets of needs. Um, I'll leave it there for the moment, Chair. Thank you. Martin, thank you very much for that very comprehensive review and, and we certainly appreciate the fact that you give us quite a detailed paper beforehand. Um, I'm going to pass now to members for any questioning. I'm going to go first of all to the Deputy Chair. Uh, Martin, uh, Jacqueline, it's uh, Doug Beattie, the Deputy Chair. Um, thank you very much for 
uh, your briefing. It was indeed very comprehensive and, and, uh, and extremely interesting, I, I would say. Um, could I just ask, um, and again, and I, I stick with these things quite general, but under the snappily named New Decade at New Approach um, deal, um, there's going to be an Office of Identity and Cultural Expression, um, and it seems to me that TBUC will sort of bleed into that slightly and tov dovetail into it. Um, how do you see um, how do you see CRC dovetailing into the the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression along with the likes of the Flags Identity Culture and Tradition Culture and uh, Traditions Commission? Okay, thank you, uh, Jeffrey. I'll start this off. Maybe you can, if you want to, come in if I leave anything out. Uh, I mean, I, I I was watching your your session with the first the deputy first minister before we came on, uh, and that question was asked about what what's actually the detail around the new office and the new commissioners, and and I suppose at this stage because we don't have any detailed information about the structures, we won't know that until it's published. It's really hard to comment in detail. However, the the role of of CRC remains the same, and it's about leading and supporting change towards reconciliation, tolerance and mutual trust. Uh, and we've come a long way, but we realise there's still plenty of work to be done. We hope to hear more in due course about the new structures, in particular the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression. There is reference within the, the, the New Deal papers that have gone public that uh, CRC would work closely. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, the, the Office of the Executive and the T-Box strategy will be impacted. Uh, as part of that, we're happy to play our part. The only, the only clear difference I can say at this stage is that our work within the Community Relations Council has moved on, I suppose, over 30 years from purely single identity work into more of social cohesion. And the, while it's difficult to comment, you might well think that the, the, the Office of Identity and Culture will be looking at particularly the two identities and cultures within Northern Ireland. And there's a fair bit of work to be done there in terms of building up the capacity within both sectors. I think we'll then merge at a point when it's when it's moving into the, the more cohesive approach that there might well be a role for, for CRC. But I've no doubt in terms of the, the, the tools and the toolkits that we have at our disposal, we're happy to share and to work with whatever emerges out of the new structures. Just at this stage, it's a bit difficult to, to give any further detail on that. I don't know whether, Jacqueline, you wanted to add to that. Just to say that uh, in the information that is there so far, it is clear that there are potential areas of collaboration, um, but not only for us, for tourism, for heritage, uh, for the arts and so on. So I think there will certainly be uh, plenty for us all to do in terms of making sure that this all ties up very well together and that we end up with a very cohesive um, set of options that deliver on the wishes of the executive but are also uh, really helpful to the community. Uh, Martin, thank you for that. I, I guess what I'm trying to wingle out if, if there was anything happening behind the scenes because like you, uh, we get a sense that some of these things maybe aren't moving at a pace that we, we thought they, they may be but, but it's clear that yeah. there's a lot more still to come out on that and, and, and I guess it's nobody's fault where we are at this moment in time. Can I ask a very brief question? Jacqueline, this is probably for you, and it's a, again, it's quite a pointed question. When I look at the All Programmes Grant Expenditure for District Council areas, there's an extraordinary amount that goes to Belfast City Council. And then if I look at Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avonborough Council, it's, it's a poultry amount, given it's the, uh, the second largest um, council area in Northern Ireland. Is there, is there a reason? I mean, even if I look at Derry City and Straban, District Council, it's, it's a fraction of what Belfast gets. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the chart you'll see for that last um, audited financial year, it was around 60%. Um, as I say, uh, said, the North Belfast Strategic Good Relations Programme, which is a very specific ring-fenced intervention, um, which makes an investment of, of about uh, £670,000, is part of that overall figure. So that does skew what the figures look like. But having said all of that, um, the distribution of funding tends to reflect a couple of things. First of all, the population distribution, and also where there are organisations that are, are already working, because they tend to be the ones that are bidding in to receive grants to us as a funder or indeed any other funder. 
So we always do, we're always mindful of that. We work very closely with organisations like the Rural Community Network and with the Good Relations Officers in the District Councils to support the development of new projects where they are needed and to, uh, to encourage uh, it would be very regularly the case that the council might be putting some money into a project, but then that same group will come through to us for a small grant to support some element of what they're trying to deliver. So between us all, I think we are trying to encourage work to be done where it is needed. But there's no doubt that there are areas that have, have less of a take-up of grants um, for a whole range of reasons. Yeah, sure, sure. Can I, can I just add, add to Jacqueline's uh, reply there, I mean, just, just to give you a practical example. Our, our, our funding also funds a, a number of core groups, and we had a session yesterday with, with a few of those groups just to see where things are moving to. Now, what one, one group that the committee, one core group that the committee might well be aware of would be TIDES. Uh, and Lisa Wilkinson, who heads that up, was telling us yesterday, while, while we fund the core group, we fund their core running costs. We don't fund projects for those core groups. Those core groups uh, attract funding from a range of sources. Now, Lisa is currently down in the ABC Council area, doing a lot of good work in, in Lurgan. And clearly, while, while the paperwork and the charts don't show you know, a, a direct line of REC funding, because our work is, is as much about building capacity, it enables groups that might well be perceived as Belfast-centric, but in fact, at the practical level, they're using the funding uh, that they are acquiring outside CRC, but because of CRC core funding to work in those areas. And some of the messages that Lisa was bringing forward was yesterday about you know groups on the ground, particularly communities in transition. The key issues currently are around in the middle of COVID. It's about poverty. It's about mental health issues. So our work's touching right across the spectrum. And, and I suppose you can't really judge you know, in terms of spread of money what the impact is and the whole purpose of the core funding scheme is to enable those groups to reach out. Whenever I took over the council, I'm, I'm a Newry man, and I suppose at that board level, one of the questions, I was asking the same question, I mean, coming from the outside, it could, could be perceived that CRC is a very Belfast-centric organisation, and until I got my head around that and then started to realise there's a lot of stuff going on, there's still stuff to be done, there, as Jacqueline said in her initial presentation, the same areas tend to fall down the bottom of the list across a lot of funding streams, which really says to me there's a lot of capacity building work to be done, particularly within the most deprived rural communities, to give them the skill set to be able to target whatever funding streams are available. No, listen, Martin, Jacqueline, th thank you again. I, I mean, you're, you're painting a, a, you know, a very vivid picture of this. I mean, it, just looking at the table, it's extraordinary. A million and a half goes to Belfast City Council, um, and Mid Ulster as a rural council gets, gets four grand. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just when you're looking at it, but you, you've explained it well, and I'm happy enough with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The pass to Martina. Um, thank you. Thank you both. And it's the first time I've had an opportunity to um, engage with you and have an exchange of views. I just want to uh, pick up uh, on, on where the last comment was made, and people will not be surprised that, um, that I'm looking at Darien Straban, but I'm very much disturbed about Mid Ulster. You cannot say that this has been allocated at all or that you know any of the assessment is taking population distribution into account. When you look at 146,000 is the population of Mid-Ulster and less than 4,000. And this is in the context of everyone's political uh, view. All you have to do is read Anne Cadwallader's book around Mid-Ulster and the Murder Triangle. So I'm assuming that there's lots needs to be done in that particular area around reconciliation. And yet when you look at the funding and the allocation that uh, I am really disturbed, disturbed about when I look at the, the Belfast, and this is obviously before Pat here, who's from Belfast, from West Belfast, and I support all the work that's going on around reconciliation. But I think the councils could not help but look at that and be most disappointed um, at how, uh, how this has been allocated, particularly uh, to their council. And I think Mid-Ulster just is striking, given that the population distribution, um, I think Derry is in there as well, um, and then when you look at the allocation that has gone to try to advance peace and reconciliation, um, I don't think that's a good track record at all. 
any... Uh, well, I take that, Martin? Yeah, Chair, well, unfortunately, I, my sound waned considerably during that, yeah, so yeah. if you jump I, in, I, I'll come out the back of it. Yeah, uh, of course. Um, Martina, thank you for your question. The, uh, the first thing to say, it's really important to understand it, is that we are an open funder. Uh, so essentially, our calls are open. We take uh, applications from all across the region, and we encourage applications from all across the region, and then we fund on the basis of that. So where you see smaller numbers of applications or smaller allocations, uh, it's not because our funding streams are directed in any particular direction that, that would run against that. It's simply that we are not getting applications from those areas. Um, having said that, I completely agree with you. Um, that is down my part of the world where I originally come from as well. So my heart would certainly be with rural uh, take-up on these types of programmes. But if you're talking to organisations like the Rural Community Network, they will say that as funding has decreased more generally across the board, many, many of the smaller bodies that would have been working in rural areas are n either not there anymore or have gone back to being largely volunteer orientated. That puts a lot of pressure on core funded groups like our rural uh, community network because the underpinning structures aren't there in the way that they used to be and the posts aren't there in the way that they used to be. So this is one of the things that happens with when you're trying to build capacity. If some of the resource goes away from elsewhere, then the organizations aren't in a position to bid to do more work because they simply don't have the staff to do it. We are very mindful of all of that and work, as I, as I think I'd, I'd mentioned, with the, the local councils and indeed the executive office every year to identify where the gaps are and to work with that local council through funding fairs or um, information events or indeed other bodies that we know that are working in those areas to encourage them to come forward with bids. We do find it very frustrating as well, though. So, uh, But we work collaboratively, and we do our best to try to ensure that uh, we can encourage more to happen in, in rural areas, and we will continue to do that. Can I, can I just, just add to that, Chair? Um, you know, I think, Martini, you, you raise a very valid question. My, my, my background in my working life, I chaired the Rural Development Council based in Cookstown for over 10 years, and we also had the Rural Development Council and the Rural Community Network, that was at a time when there were large streams of both European funding and international fund for Ireland funding, and we managed to, to deliver that. But Jacqueline's response, which is very valid in terms of our, our, our programs, are open calls. But in, in my experience in, in the rural funding sector, sometimes open calls just aren't sufficient, and sometimes funders and departments need to go in with a more strategic approach to say, we've looked at this area, we've taken up the evidence, there are a number of problems here that existing funded streams either are not targeting or don't have sufficient funds to cover. What we would be happy to do would be to talk to TEO colleagues and then come back to the committee at some stage to look at, is there an opportunity to take a more strategic approach in the areas that you've clearly identified as either not targeting the open calls or whether no other funders have targeted the issues that are so prevalent out there. I'd be happy to come back to the committee at some stage with that if that helps. Just about there being, you know, is there an opportunity? I think it's of strategic importance that it's done. Yeah. I, I don't think that um, the years that CRC is in existence, uh, that we can have a situation that for over a decade um, and more, that we're looking now at groups and organisations, particularly in rural areas, and you know, you could you could understand them feeling a sense of abandonment. And if we're going to be trying to target areas most uh, in need, and particularly a new decade, new approach, objective need in the heart of allocating funding, Section 75, you know, the duty and responsibility that, uh, that public bodies have to ensure that, um, that they reach the, those categories, the nine categories, the Section 75 categories, and that when policy is being de devised or work is being done, that it is making sure that those categories aren't 
um, aren't affected by it detrimentally. And I'm assuming if I was sitting here re re you know, representing Mid Ulster, I would be demanding that something is done about this. So, and, and as an or as a, a committee who is here to scrutinise for on behalf of everyone in the north, that's why I'm demanding for Mid Ulster that has to change. I think it would be helpful for us, and I know you give us a lot of information, and I want to thank you for that and the work that you have done to bring this to our attention. But could you provide a geographical breakdown of each of your funding? In programs, obviously now with the exception of North Belfast grant scheme, because I can see um, that in Appendix Two, um, that in terms of the core funding uh, organisation and does not have a geographical breakdown. But could we have that? And can we also what process does the CRC apply um, in terms of to funding applications? You know how, for instance, for example. Uh, do you apply that, as I was talking about earlier, that Section 75 duty, and then the allocation of funding based on objective need, as is outlined in New Decade, New Approach? And again, if we could have the information, I have, wasn't able to find it in the paper, um, because throughout the document you referred to and mentioned groups of strategic importance. So can we get a list of who are these groups? Where are these groups? And I think that the committee would find that helpful. Um, maybe could you, could you provide the clerk with that and we'll write formally to, okay. to the Just CRC? Just to say to you that some people are coming in to say to you that the stream has gone down. And okay. they can't uh, is, there, is there anybody online there? Yeah, Chair, Chair unfortunately, my, my sound was waning uh, towards the end of that, but I got the gist of what Martina was saying. Yes, we're happy to take that back to gather the evidence and bring it back to the committee. So it's a very valid point. We're happy to, 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 to provide the detail on that. Also, I think it is just from the... The, you know, for the public purse perspective, if, if all taxpayers are, and ratepayers from right across Northern Ireland are paying into a pot from which you get money for one council to get areas population to get a million and a half and another to get 4,000, it does raise that question that we would then maybe just see some more evidence just about how that's been, been balanced out, you know, so um, that, that would be, be useful. Um, do we still have Emma, George, Trevor? Um, George, are you online there still? Do you have any questions? I'm still online. Yes, yes, I am, uh, Chair. No, I, I have no questions. No, I'm, I'm okay. Thanks. Good man. Emma, are you online there? Would you have any questions? I am. I have to go shortly because I have another meeting, but um, I would just echo uh, my party colleague has, has uh, made representations there on behalf of the Mid Ulster, so uh, obviously in agreement with, with everything that she has said there, so um, I think that's probably it. Covered. Okay, thank you, no parochialism. No <laughs> the Mid Ulster MLA agrees. <laughs> uh, and Trevor, I didn't know she was still there, so I was to make sure I was standing up. For Trevor, are you, are you still online there? No, I think we've lost Trevor. Uh, Martin and Jacqueline, look, we, I think uh, we, we've had quite a number of these presentations now, and I know that that's certainly one of the most in-depth presentation papers that we've given, so I wouldn't say that the lack of questioning is a reflection of any lack of interest. I think a lot of, was, of the information was covered was in there. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I know my experience of the Community Relations Council would go right back to the 1990s as a youth work student where we would have went in to use the library that was available as a resource in your uh, offices to be able to help inform our studies. So uh, my knowledge certainly extends right back to the beginning of your organisation. But can I take the opportunity to thank you for coming along today, to thank you for waiting for so long to come in and answer the questions. Uh, and we will write... Just uh, George here again. Yes, um, just before before the two, um, they, they've done a, an excellent presentation there, very very worthwhile listening to you. And uh, although I didn't take part, I would like to make one comment. Yes. That's in relation to the North Bel North Belfast initiative. Yes. I think that is fantastic. You know, particularly what we're going through at the present time with this pandemic, and the excellent excellent work that uh, those people are doing is, has to be highly highly commended. And that's. That would be my, my take on it. It's, it's brilliant, brilliant work that they're doing, and uh, I'd like to pass on my uh, comments um, and congratulations to the brilliant work that they, they're all doing up there. That's great, George. Thanks for those comments. Thank chair, you. chair, chair. Just just before we we sign off, can I just give an assurance to Martina that I've heard the message about Ms Ulster loud and clear, and we we will. I will 
give a personal commitment with Jacqueline to delve into that, and we'll come back to the committee or to many of the committee members individually if, if that's so required. And, 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 I, I and thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. I don't want you to forget Darian Shaban either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on quickly. <laughs> okay, listen, thank you very much indeed for your attendance via tally conference today at the committee. Th thank you, and we'll let, we'll let you go from there. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Okay, members, um, can, I, can I just ask from uh, both George and Emma, I know Emma you've said that you've had to go, um, that George if you could let us know if you're leaving because um, there's only four of us in the room and we need five to be quartered, so I'm hoping five minutes will get us through the rest of what's here. Okay. Um, so, just to move... Yeah, I'll, I'll hang on to her, no problem. Oh, good. Thank you, George. Uh, item six, then, is the uh, functioning of government miscellaneous bill. Uh, page 16 in your table pack and page 84 of the meeting pack provides some of the information. There includes in that a summary of the written evidence that's been received to date by the Committee for Finance, and that starts on page 86. Um, and that, then, is updated by the evidence that we've received from the Executive Office. Officials have indicated that all are part of clauses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 12 are of relevance to the Executive Office, and then I'm going to propose that these are the clauses in which the Committee should concentrate. Are members content that we approach with it in that method? Okay. okay. And just to advise you that the Executive Office have been provisionally scheduled to give an oral evidence on the, to the Committee on the 10th of June, and that the Bill sponsor has confirmed that he will attend on the 17th of June. So if members are content, then the oral evidence session will be with David Sterling as Permanent Secretary and Head of the Civil Service on the 10th of June. Are we content with that? Yep. Okay. And is there any other evidence um, based from receipt to be received from the executive office that we think we should have, or we can take a decision when take we get that when we get information? That. Okay. Um, so, if members are happy, then we'll go to item seven, which is the forward work program. It begins on page 134 of the meeting pack. Uh, we have departmental officials will attend next week to brief us on Brexit issues. <laughs> uh, so, given that it's in vogue, uh, and then there, uh, we've mentioned there about the the 10th and, and 17th of June. So, would and then we have the junior ministers to do with Brexit later in June. And I think the first and deputy first minister have indicated that they will come yeah. back to this. So, are members content roughly with what's in the forward work program? Yeah. Yes, content. Okay. <laughs> Then item 8 is correspondence. There are six items of correspondence in the meeting pack. Item 8.4, which is on page 146, is correspondence from the Committee for Justice on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. Now, it is a far-reaching uh, bill which cuts across lots of various areas of responsibility, which includes those uh, from the Executive Office. Would members be content if we write to the Executive Office and ask how the bill impacts them and their department, and then when we receive that written evidence, we can give a consideration? Yeah. Members content? Content, yeah. Okay, and item uh, 8.6 on page 156 of the meat pack is correspondence from an individual regarding historical institutional abuse. Um, as you'll be aware, we try to direct that where we can to the relevant place rather than considering individual uh, issues. So I'm going to suggest that we send the correspondence to the Office of the Lord Chief Justice and ask that the Lord Chief Justice would respond directly to the individual and that the copies of that response could be sent to us on the committee. Would members be content with that? Mm -hmm. and, yes. yeah. Okay, item 8.7 on page 24 of the table pack is a raised briefing on monitoring rounds. So there are some scrutiny points contained within that document that are relevant to ourselves as the Executive Office, and for handiness they're highlighted in yellow. Um, we do have on the 3rd of June uh, the Department uh, June monitoring round, so it might be helpful if we had um, responses to the scrutiny points for that session. So would members be happy if we forward that, those questions and those queries to the department and ask them for their consideration of it so that we can consider it at the, on the 3rd of June? June yeah. Members content? Yeah. Yep. Uh, are members happy for us to note the remaining items of correspondence? Great. Okay. Uh, item 9, Chairman's business, I have none there. Uh, item 10, any other business? Is there any other business that's... I would just, yes. like, I would just like to um, comment on what was said by the Joint First Ministers before they left around the historical institutional abuse. I think it's, you know, it's important that, um, that we have been notified 
that some of the payments now have started to be made. I've actually been contacted by one of the victims to express their appreciation for the work that has been done and the relief that it is causing. And the, I think one of the matters that they would like to discuss further, I think, with ourselves, we had not mentioned this last time, was how we honour and mark them in remembrance. Um, I know there's a few that, for instance, some of the victims who took their lives or died uh, prematurely, too early, too soon, with everything that was happening to them, and that they don't even have a headstone, and how maybe perhaps that it wouldn't be as much as, you know, some of them think it's not needed a statue here in this estate as much as maybe something in their headstones and a, a plaque or something like that. So, and we, t we had discussed it, that's something we would return to, but I think it's good to acknowledge uh, what the ministers said to us today, and that's welcome news. Given the, um, you know, obviously the importance of that, um, I know that I, from representations from all groups, have been trying to encourage the process for the commissioner to be appointed as quickly as, as possible. possible. Yeah. And I think we still have that assurance that that's a process that will yeah. hopefully take place in the next month, with a, you know, with August maybe being an appointment period. Yeah. Might that be something that we could discuss that's as an yeah. agenda yeah. item with the new commissioner so that we make sure it's quite high up yeah. there on their, if their work? Somebody could have that in their memory bank because yeah. it might drop out okay. of mind. That's part. Chair, can I just can I just come in because I, I think it was pretty significant as well. Where that's, that's a good news story. Yes. Mm -hmm. The victims' payment scheme is not a good news story, yeah. and that's due to kick in. Okay. Or people are expecting it to kick in ten days' time, and it's not going to. So, do we need to find out when, what's happening, what's the issue, where the problem is? Because it looks like they haven't even ad nominated an administrator to administrate the scheme yet. Okay. Should we, um, can we write to, to the department and ask for a written response maybe yes. for next week to consider yeah, uh, on, on where, where are we at with it, where is it going, what are your, now, your new time skills in light of COVID so that we can give it to consideration? Yeah, I well, think you so. can write, but you'll not get it for next week. Yeah. Well. I mean, within the early time frames, it's, it's two weeks plus. Okay. But I'd be hoping that, that the executive office, if they're not going to meet their time scales in 10 days' time, they'll be telling people they're not making it in 10 days' time and they will be giving a you know, an announcement of, of what their new timescales is. They can't just leave these people hanging on. Yeah, and I would think as well, maybe if they don't, if they aren't going to meet the timescales that they would write to the department before that expires to tell us that they're not going to read it. So we could put that in the request and that might prompt a response a bit quicker as well, Doug, for next week in terms yeah. of if they're going to tell us that in three days, hence from that, they're not going to meet a deadline. So, yeah. But we would need to find out what yeah. the plan is behind that well, if they're I think not. So, I mean. Ten days out. I mean, it's disappointing that sure. we weren't made aware of, of just how badly a, it, a model it is. And I think the point that was made by the ministers that you know that there isn't the funding in the budget. That's right. Uh, oh, yeah. In this, and and it, this is, and we've we've heard this before from you know from international human rights commissioners and others saying that the responsibility for paying for this resides uh, with the British government. This all happened during a time of direct will. And, uh, and that is one of the, and we also need the full implementation of the Stormont House Review as well. Days out from that as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Members, if that's us finished with any other business, then item 11 is date, time and place of next meeting. So that is uh, Wednesday of next week at two o'clock in this room. Thank, thank you, you very much thank indeed. You. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Now in Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.